Hey guys. This is part 2 of what if Sasuke was in Lord of the Rings. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. We are pay, that's all. We are God. Chapter 4. Up in the air, down in the rock. Location, the Fellowship. They had been climbing the mountain for two weeks now. They didn't reach any snow until the end of the first week. When they did, there was nothing but snow. On a good day, the snow would be only an inch or so thick and therefore would be easily walked over. But as they climbed, the good days soon became distant and the snow around them got larger and larger. What was worse was when the sun was shining brightly down on them, making the snow reflect the light. If I had known I was going to be making my way through this kind of snow in this much light ten years ago, I would have brought sunglasses, Sasuke grumbled silently as he climbed up the trail Gandalf had made from the front. Sure, he hadn't been afraid to climb some mountains since coming to Middle-earth, for that was where the orc bands had usually tried to escape to, but never one this high. A grunt of surprise and the sound of someone falling downhill made him turn around to see what was going on. Frodo had slipped on a small clump of snow and rolling down the trail. Frodo, said Aragorn as he caught the hobbit and got him back on his feet. Frodo quickly wiped off the snow but noticed that the ring was missing from around his neck. He saw that it, and the chain he carried it on, had fallen onto the snow beneath them. It was picked up by Boromir, who then held it in the air by the chain. Boromir, Aragorn called out to him. The rest of the fellowship had now turned to see what was happening. It is a strange fate that we should suffer so much fear and doubt over so small a thing, the man from Gundor said as he stared at the ring. Such a little thing. He reached up to touch it, but a hand grasped his arm firmly and for a moment, he felt something directed at him. Once that moment was gone, he realized what he was doing and looked at the ring with a small measure of horror, but also lust. Boromir, Sasuke said from his side, for it was his hand holding back the arm. Give the ring back to Frodo. He released the grip he had and stepped back. Boromir hesitated for a moment, making Aragorn slowly reach for his sword. As you wish, Sasuke, the captain general said. I care not. He made his way slowly down to Frodo and offered the ring, which the hobbit quickly took. He grinned at both Frodo and Aragorn but when they didn't return it he laughed a short laugh and ruffled Frodo's hair before turning around. Could we get a move on? Gimli asked the rest of the fellowship. Let's find a place to rest for the evening so we are not out in the freezing cold like the last three nights. Indeed, let us continue, Gandalf agreed, turning back to forge the path ahead. The rest of the fellowship followed after the wizard. I am sure that we will find a nice cave to rest our weary feet in, Master Dwarf. Legolas said to Gimli, looking back at him while they climbed. Well, if we happen to find a forest up here, I will be sure to let you know, Master Elf, he replied, matching the smile on the elf's face. But I cannot guarantee that it will be green and full of life. Rather, I think it will ice blue and frozen too. Gimli, you've just described my feet, Pippin told the dwarf. And I think that if you keep talking about it, they'll come right off. Peregrine took, your feet won't come off, Gandalf said aloud without looking back at him. However, if you don't keep moving, I will help them come off. So please keep moving. I am moving, I am moving. The hobbit moved quickly up the trail, going past the other two hobbits near him. Pippin, you almost scared Bill. Sam chided him while also placing a reassuring hand on the pack pony. Sorry, Bill. He called out to the pony, who seemed to nicker in response. Location, Isengard. Saruman stood in the depth of the factory he had created in the grounds of Isengard. All around him, the orcs under his command worked and toiled, creating weapons and armor, digging out his new creations and seeing that they were ready. The factory rang with all the sounds of hammer, tongs, swords, shields, armor, and fire. Amidst these sounds, the cawing of Creebane joined. The birds themselves flew into the factory as a flock flapping through the numerous and voluminous openings that stretched from the cracked openings in the soil over their heads to the deepest levels beneath them. When they saw where the white wizard stood, they flew to him and began telling him their message. 
having learned the language of birds long ago, he knew what they were saying with ease. When they had finished telling their tale, they flew away through the factory. So Gandalf, you tried to lead them over Caradras, he mused to himself as he walked away from the ledge where he had stood. Any orcs that were nearby paid no attention to him, for he did not call out to any of them. And if that fails, where then will you go? If the mountain defeats you, will you risk a more dangerous road? He walked out of the factory built into the earth of Isengard and back into the tower. Ah, but I forget, Gandalf. You would not take that road unless you were forced. So I shall force you. Location, the Fellowship Three days had passed since the small incident with Boromir, who was now doing his best to keep his distance. But that was impossible now. A sudden storm had struck on the third while they were traveling with a cliff to one side and the open air on the other, making the snow reach the wastes of the tall people and the fellowship easily. The short people weren't so fortunate. While Gimli could handle himself, the hobbits had to be carried by Aragorn and Boromir. How much farther can we go to find safety? Boromir called out to Gandalf while carrying Merry and Pippin. I fear for the hobbits. I cannot safely say. The gray wizard told him from the front, making a path through the snow with his staff. This storm and winds clouds my sight. Do you want me to scout ahead? Sasuke asked him. While Legolas was nimble enough to walk on the top of the snow, he did the same by applying chakra to his feet. He kept pace with the front of the path so he could help in any way he could. But he only shook his head. No, do not do that. I fear that if you do, you won't be able to find us again. The raven-haired man snorted at those words. I think I'll be able to find my way back. You forget what I wield. The snowstorm had nothing on his sharingan. He would be able to see fine. Even so, please stay. It's best that we keep together. Fine, he said. Perhaps the wizard was right. He might be able to see through the snow, but he did not know this mountain. That alone could get him lost. They continued to forge a path through the snow with the wind howling through them. Time seemed to slow down as they went forward, for it was only Gandalf who was forging the trail and with only his staff. At times, Sasuke wondered if he should help by using Katan Jutsus to melt the snow. But then he reminded himself that in this cold of weather, the snow that melted would turn to ice in a short amount of time. As they made their way, Legolas heard something faint. He moved forward to hear it better which got the attention of Sasuke. What is it? He asked the elf. He didn't answer straight away. Instead he listened to the wind. The wind carried that something to his ears. It turned out to be a voice, chanting words in Quenya, one of the most ancient languages in the world. But the voice chanting the words sounded wrong to him. There's a fell voice in the air, he told the fellowship. Gandalf listened to the wind and heard the voice as well. And he knew that voice. It's Saruman, he shouted in alarm. At that moment, large boulder-sized chunks of snow-encrusted stone broke free of the cliff above them. They fell down to the path, making the fellowship put their backs against the stone to protect themselves. They were successful, as the chunks struck the snow pushed to the side and then fell down even further. But the danger was still there. He's trying to bring down the mountain. Aragorn shouted over the storm. Gandalf, we must turn back. No. The wizard climbed out of the path and onto a nearby clump of hard snow. He began chanting in Quenya too, turning it into a duel of words between him and Saruman. Everyone else could watch in silence as the duel raged on. If it had been any other time, they would have found the words that came from Gandalf's lips to sound beautiful. He wasn't sure how the duel was going for either side, but Sasuke still had his eyes and the Sharingan was blazing. Past the wind and the snow, he could see the small flashes of light in the clouds. Whether this was some part of the duel or not, he didn't know and he didn't care. He saw an opportunity to end it. Old man! He called out to the wizard. He didn't seem to hear him, so he tried something else. Gandalf, get clear! This time, the gray wizard did hear him and though he looked at Cravender with some surprise, he did as he was told. The raven-haired shinobi took the clump and raised his bandaged hand into the air. He channeled his chakra through it, and it manifested as lightning engulfing his palm, stunning most of the fellowship. Directing his hand skyward, 
he discharged his chakra and sent it flying towards the clouds. Once it was there, he could feel the energy inside the clouds and the person trying to harness it. Not this time, he silently declared. He caught the person off guard and took control of the storm. Lightning began to dance amidst the clouds, flowing to a central point. Once there was enough, a shape began to form. It took the shape that the rest of the fellowship did not know of, a shape of a worm-like creature with whiskers and red eyes. It opened its mouth and roared before disappearing back into the clouds. In the moment of silence that followed, with all eyes on him and the cloud, Sasuke spoke in his native language. Be gone with a thunderclap. He roared into the wind, lowering his hand and directing the jutsu at the original harnesser. The clouds boomed with thunder and lightning shot through the storm clouds, back to its point of origin. But because of all the noise from the roar and thunder, more of the mountain, mostly snow from the tip above, broke off and fell towards them. Look out! Aragorn shouted out, throwing himself back against the stone. The others did the same and Sasuke leapt from the clump. He landed back on the path just in time as the path was almost immediately buried in more snow, what rocks that fell went straight down. After the snow had stopped falling, they began digging themselves out with desperate hands formed into claws. Kami take it, Sasuke, you overdid it, the raven-haired Jinobi thought to himself as he got free. The first thing he saw was Bill. The pack pony's head was free of the snow as well as its back. Everything else was buried. We must get off the mountain. Boromir shouted at Gandalf over the wind and snow. Make for the Gap of Rohan and take the west road to my city. The Gap of Rohan takes us too close to Isengard. Aragorn reminded him. It would be like walking into a trap now. We cannot pass over the mountain. Let us go under it. Gimli declared. Let us go through the mines of Moria. The Grey Wizard went still when he heard that. Saruman's words echoed in his head. You know what they awoke in the darkness of Khazad-dum, shadow and flame. Let the ring-bearer decide, he finally announced. Frodo looked surprised to hear that. To be frank, either did the rest of the fellowship. They had all looked to the wizard among them for leadership. But as the hobbit in question stayed silent, they looked back to Gandalf. We cannot stay here, Boromir told him. This will be the death of the hobbits. Sasuke looked at the four hobbits and saw the truth in those words. They looked half-frozen in the snow. But that did not sway Gandalf. Frodo, he said to the hobbit. The ring-bearer was still hesitating, not sure of what to say. But when he noticed that all eyes were still on him, he made his choice. We will go through the mines. So be it. Location, Isengard. Saruman strode into his study, angry and annoyed. He was annoyed for not ensuring that the so-called fellowship would fail to pass through Caradras and angry for having his lightning taken and redirected back at himself. It was only due to his preparation of a spell of shielding that the lightning bolt that struck did not destroy him or the tower. But never, in all his years in Middle-earth, did someone try to strike him with his own attack. It made him furious. There was no other way to put it. If he was a lesser being, he would have started destroying the study in a rage but he was not a lesser being and he would control his anger. It was better to use it as fuel to further his designs rather than waste it. He stalked over to his chair and sat down in it. Nearby on the table was his pipe, as black as his staff. He grabbed it and lit, taking a puff. When he had first learned of pipeweed from Gandalf, he had mocked and insulted the Grey Wizard for it. But it was only six decades later that he took up the habit himself, and he could admit that he found it pleasant. It also helped him think. He had seen a glimpse of the one who wrested control of the lightning from him. What stood out the most of this person were his eyes, blazing blood red. He had only seen those once before, sixty years ago. It had been that infernal company of dwarves came to Rivendell, along with the hobbit that soon carried the one ring. But it wasn't the hobbit or the dwarves that had his interest. It was the man who had followed them, the one who seemed to observe rather than speak. After they had left, while the White Council had still been in session, he had heard of what that man had done, having brought the dragon smog to the ground and ripping his wings off. But he was more curious about how the man had done it. He kept asking and searching, but only found rumors. 
One such rumor was that the man had been a Maya and taken a giant form, which Saruman found ridiculous. Another rumor was the man had called out for the Vala for help and the Vala answered him by giving him the strength to fight the dragon, which he found even more ridiculous. The Vala wouldn't lift a finger to help a man or anyone else. They would rather watch in silence as the world around them fell to nothing. A variation of the second rumor was that he had called on the Vala from his own land to do battle with the dragon. Despite all the different rumors, they all agreed on three things. When the man fought the dragon, he took the larger shape of a man fully armored, the color of this larger man was purple, and was made of fire. Such was Saruman's curiosity that, when the man left for his own land, the white wizard sent men after him. They made it to the land and began sending reports back to their master. He found the lands were called the Elemental Nations and seemed to be in a constant state of semi-war. The people seemed to embrace the savageness of their inner nature and yet, they wielded powers that made him jealous and envious. He had sent orders to see if they could capture one of the warriors called Shinobi and if so, bring them back to him. Alas, that proved to be an impossible task. Even the clumsiest of Shinobi were able to spot his men and either evade them or kill them. But now, there was one such Shinobi here in Middle-earth. More than that, it appeared that this one was a descendant of the man that traveled with the company of dwarves. And if he carried the same power his ancestor had. What Saruman could breed into his new creations with those eyes. He placed down his pipe, his mind decided. He will have those eyes. Location, the Fellowship Since they had admitted defeat on Karadras and decided to go through the mines of Moria, they had to turn back. And since the snow had fallen on them, they had to remake the path. Ironically enough, once they had freed Bill, the pack pony proved to be just as able to forge path as well as Gandalf. They were also lucky to find out that their path wasn't completely ruined. A day or so since they turned back, they found the remnants of their path. There had been some snow on top of it, but it wasn't enough to cause a problem. Instead, they were able to stomp it down quick enough to walk through it. When they began to actually make their way down the mountain, another storm hit them. It was not as serious or hard as the one Saruman had conjured, but still one worthy enough to be weary of. But Gimli had found a cave big enough to hold them comfortably, if not a little tightly, until the weather. They had enough wood on Bill's pack to make a fire so they kept warm inside the cave. An interesting thing about the cave was that the sides and roof were covered in snow that had a thin layer of ice coating the surface. The light from the fire shone different shades on the lights, giving the fellowship a bit of show. I can see why the dwarves like to live beneath the mountains if they can see this every day, Legolas admitted to Gimli. If you are impressed by this, Master Elf, then what lays deeper in our mountains will astound you, the dwarf told him. Veins of metal that run through the stone like great currents of streams and rivers, caverns where clumps and clusters of jewels shine and sparkle when light is cast upon them, and the sound of water coursing through the stone and rock only to fall into an abyss is what lies beneath the surface of our mountains. Hearing this talk about of your home reminds me of the Shire, Sam said gimly. I hope that I will be able to see its green hills and flowing streams again. He could picture it now and if he closed his eyes, he could feel the warm sun on his face. We all feel the same way about our homes, young Samwise, Gandalf told him with a general agreement from the rest of the fellowship. The only person who held his silence was Sasuke and the others noticed. What? He asked when he saw that their eyes were on him. Don't you miss your home? Pippin asked him. I lost the right to call Kanoha my home. Why? What did you do? Drop it, Pippin, he told the hobbit sharply. All he did was make the took confused. Drop what? I'm not holding anything to drop. While he stifled the urge to shake his head and rolled his eyes, Gandalf stepped in. He is telling you to let it go, Peregrine took. What he has to say about his home is for him to say. So don't bother him. Pippin didn't say anything, so Boromir took the chance to do so. I've been meaning to thank you, Sasuke, for stopping me that day, he said to the man known as Crabender. Frodo and Aragorn began to feel uneasy when they heard those words. There's no need to thank me, Sasuke answered. Still, I must thank you. The man from Gundor looked just as uncomfortable as Frodo and Aragorn. I would like to think that I am a good man who wants peace. That's where you're wrong. 
the raven-haired man interrupted him. You are not a good man. That certainly surprised him, as he could only respond with, What? Mr. Sasuke, I think that Mr. Boromir is a very good man, Sam declared, coming to Boromir's defense. I, I'll stand by that, Gimli agreed. As will I, Legolas said. Same here, Mary spoke out. I think so too, Pippin announced. The Captain General looked grateful for the support he received, although he cast an uncertain look on Aragorn and Frodo when they didn't say anything. But Sasuke only frowned. You're not listening to what I'm not saying, he told them. None of you are good men and you won't find peace like that. Lad, I should warn, I can and will take offense at such words, Gimli said, his voice rumbling with a growl. While they didn't say it, the rest of the fellowship, minus the Grey Wizard, showed on their faces that they agreed with the dwarf. Sasuke, perhaps you could say what you're not saying? Gandalf suggested with a small smile on his lips and what looked like a twinkle in his eyes. These people would not have made it as shinobi, he thought to himself as he mentally rolled his eyes. None, none of you are good men but neither are any of you evil men. The looks they had on their faces were replaced by with looks of confusion. How could we not be good men and not be evil men? Frodo asked. Okay then, baby steps. He stood up from where he was sitting and walked over to the nearby wall, pulling out a kanai as he walked. When he reached the wall and stood before the snow, he swiftly punched it, breaking the ice. Using all parts of the kanai, he began to carve something into the snow. His body blocked what he was carving so the fellowship could not see what he was doing. When he was done and he stepped away, they examined what he created and were confused by it. What is this symbol you have created, Crabender? Legolas asked him while still examining the symbol. The basic shape was that of a circle with a line through the center that curved slightly, separating the two parts of the circle. On one side of the circle, he had dug the snow out deep, so deep that in the light of the fire it looked black. On the other side of the circle, the white snow was untouched. The only difference on the two sides was that they had a dot of the opposite color in them. The white dot was all that was left of the snow that was dug out, and the black dot was the only part he dug out on the white side. This is the symbol of the Inyang, he told them, moving to a different patch on the wall, breaking the ice there and began carving something there. From what I've learned about Middle-earth, you see good and evil like this. He stepped away from the carving, which was a simple line and the words good and evil on either side. You see them as opposing forces that will clash again and again and have nothing to do with one another. This is where you are wrong. What do you mean by that? Aragorn asked him. Good and evil are not opposing forces. They are complements of each other. Without each other, they would not exist. That's not true, Sam protested. If there was no evil, the world would be a happier place. There would be no struggles or problems anywhere. If there was no evil, then what is good, Sam? What is light without darkness? What is the day without the night? He asked the hobbit who had no answer. Such things are defined by what is their opposite, and it applies to everything that has or will existed, even these gods you call the Vala and the Dark Lord. I do not think Sauron would agree with your words if he had heard them, Crabender, Legolas said to him. I wasn't talking about Sauron. But Sauron is the Dark Lord, Mary said to him. Who else could you be talking about? I've read the history of this part of the earth and I believe I know it well. Sauron is only the second Dark Lord. I speak of the first, Melkor. When the name was spoken, the wind outside the cave seemed to sharpen and howl, and the fire that warmed them dimmed slightly. The fellowship all looked on quietly. It has been a long time since that name was uttered in these lands, when its name was Balerian, Gandalf said, his voice quiet and solemn. And yet, Morgoth was evil, for he wanted to destroy this world. Or perhaps he realized the truth of what I've spoken and chose to become evil. He chose his path so that the world might go on. He chose to lie to his kin and shoulder the burden alone. A burden? Repeated Legolas, sounding offended by his words. You consider being a dark lord and attempting to destroy the world a burden? Yes, I do, he answered. It is a burden. A burden of being despised, hated, and cursed. A burden of everyone turning their backs or seeking to destroy you. A burden of being alone and forever being damned in the eyes of other people. Perhaps at some point, 
He did want to destroy or rule the world, but that is what Melker carried on his shoulders. Someone must always carry the darkness, shoulder that hate, otherwise it would all be pointless. Do you really believe that? Sam asked him. To the hobbit, all of it sounded a little weird, and if he was being honest, wrong. I do. He looked back at the circle. The dots represents that there's a little part darkness in the light just as there is a little part of light in the darkness. To those who know this symbol, that means you can do an evil act for good and a good act for evil. Like what? Pippin asked him. How could one do a good act for evil? I think the oath of Fenor would be one such act, he answered. He had read about the oath and what had come because of it, like the three kinslayings and the declaration that they had lost the right to what they were looking for. There was also what he had tried to do, but that wasn't the point he was trying to make. What am I trying to tell you is that you are not good men and you are not evil men. You are simply men. There is light and darkness in each and every one of us. Then how are we to be men if they're both of these in us? Boromir asked him. Are you saying that we simply need to choose which one we prefer to find our peace? He shook his head. No, you just went back to the beginning again. The key to understanding and finding peace in both light and darkness is that you must find balance. Balance? Aragorn repeated after a moment of silence. Yes, balance. You must keep the light and the darkness in balance within yourself. By doing that you will find peace, he told them. He wasn't really one to say all that, but they needed the lesson more than he did. No one said a word after that. They just stayed silent and looked at the fire, thinking over his words. The next few days were spent traveling down the mountain, almost out of the snow. And while they did not have to forge their path anymore, it was still cold enough for them to shiver. Frodo, come and help an old man Gandalf called out to the hobbit, who came over and placed himself beneath his arm. How's your shoulder? Better than it was, he answered honestly. And the ring? The wizard asked him, making him pause and look up at the bigger person between the two of them. You feel its power growing, don't you? I've felt it too. You must be careful now. Evil will be drawn to you from outside the fellowship, and I fear from within. Frodo could only cast a quick glance at Sasuke, who was passing by them. Who then do I trust? He asked Gandalf. You must trust yourself. Trust your own strength. What do you mean? There are many powers in this world for good or for evil, he told the hobbit. Some are greater than I am, and against some I have not yet been tested. Gimli, who had been walking behind them, stopped and pointed at what lay before them. The walls of Moria, he said with reverence in his voice. I will admit, that's impressive, Sasuke admitted. It may have just been a side of the mountain, but what impressed him was the sheer size of it. He could see the ends of it if he turned his head to look. It was also deceptive as the journey to them took longer than he had originally estimated. By the time they reached the walls, night had fallen. Dwarf doors are invisible when closed, Gimli told the fellowship as they walked along the walls, tapping the stone with the back of his axe. Yes, Gimli, Gandalf agreed. Their own masters cannot find them, if their secrets are forgotten. Why doesn't that surprise me? Legolas asked aloud, making the dwarf and the fellowship glare and grumble at his back. As Sasuke looked on at the two, he could only shake his head. It seems that it wasn't enough that you gave me Naruto in the form of a hobbit, Kami. You had to put him in a dwarf, and then me in an elf as well. The way Gimli and Legolas bickered back and forth reminded Crabinder too much of the old days with Naruto. And if the past was any indicator those two would become the best of friends. A splash rang out amongst them as Frodo had slipped and landed his foot in the waters near the walls. It was shockingly cold and he pulled it out just as quickly as it came in. He looked at the water, feeling uneasy about it but he did not know why. As the hobbit rejoined the fellowship, Gandalf approached a part of the wall and began to examine it more closely. Let me see, he said to himself as his hand traced over the faint cravings he found. It didn't take him long to realize what it was and exclaimed, Ithilden. What's that? Sasuke asked, having heard him. Something that is only mirrors starlight and moonlight, he answered, turning away from the door to look up at the night sky. At that moment, the clouds in front of the moon drifted away, allowing it to shine its light down on the walls. 
The cravings began to glow until it revealed the image of two columns supporting an arch with trees enveloping them. Beneath the arch was a hammer, an anvil, a crown, and seven stars while between the two trees was a single star. On the arch itself, words had been engraved. It reads the doors of Durin, Lord of Moria, speak, friend and enter, Gandalf told them all, using his staff to show where the words were. What do you suppose that means? Mary asked him. Oh, it's quite simple. If you are a friend, you speak the password and the doors will open. He placed his staff on the single star and began chanting in a different tone. Must be elvish, Sasuke thought to himself. But whatever the language was, it didn't seem to work. Gandalf frowned, and then tried to again, speaking different words. He was no successful the second time than he was the first. The mood of the fellowship, which had risen since finding the walls, began to drop again. Looks began to pass between the members and Pippin was the one who stated the obvious. Nothing's happening. Gandalf ignored him and stepped up to the door. He placed his shoulder against it and tried pushing it open. When that didn't work, he tried his hands. I once knew every spell in all the tongues of elves, men, and orcs, he muttered aloud. So you're losing your touch? Sasuke asked him with a small smirk. While the rest of the fellowship might have sent him shocked looks, Gandalf just looked at him with irritation. Now is not the time for you to prove that you are Madara's descendant, Sasuke. So, what are you going to do then? Pippin asked. That was when his temper broke. Knock your head against it, Peregrine took. And if that does not shatter them, and I'm allowed a little peace from foolish questions, I will try to find the opening words. The hobbit got the obvious hint and promptly shut up. The fellowship realized that what the wizard was planning to do would take some time. So they made themselves comfortable, as comfortable as they could get in that kind of area, and waited. No one kept track of time as they waited. The area began to fill with the sound of Gandalf speaking in different languages. Sasuke could hear all of them from where he leaned against the wall. To his surprise and silent delight, he found the languages to be soothing. They made him feel calm and relax, like something one would hear from an old relative. If it wasn't for the hint of annoyance and worry in Gandalf's voice, he would have been tempted to close his eyes and drift away into sleep. Instead, he let his eyes focus on other things, like the fact Aragorn and Sam were unpacking Bill and sending him away. Why are they doing that? He looked back at Gandalf and figured it out. A pony would probably lose its mind inside there in panic. That was never good. His attention turned to Merry and Pippin, who were throwing rocks into the water. Aragorn quickly stopped that. Do not disturb the water, he told the hobbits, grabbing Pippin's arm before he threw a rock. Oh, it's useless, Gandalf declared as he stepped away from the doors, tossed his staff to the ground, and sat down on a log. Do you want me to break them down? Sasuke asked him, gesturing to the doors. He could probably do it. It would just be loud. No, do not do that, he said in reply. There has to be a way to get them open. Do you have any idea to do that, young Sasuke? Perhaps you know something that I don't. Those words were a challenge, plain and simple. And yet, it was not a serious challenge. It was more akin to an offer to see what he had thought up. But all he did was shrug his shoulders. You make it sound like I know how to open them and I don't. All I can offer is that perhaps the creators of these doors were being both subtle and obvious about the answer. When he heard those words, a realization struck Frodo. He stood up and more closely examined the writing, even though he could not read them. It's a riddle, he declared. As he was figuring this all out, the water next to them began to ripple. Speak friend, enter. What's the elvish word for friend? He asked Gandalf. Melon, the wizard answered and at those words, the doors began to open, drawing the attention of everyone there. Chuckling a little, Gandalf stood up and led the way, placing a crystal on the tip of his staff. Both subtle and obvious, Gimli repeated with a grin as he entered through the doors beside Sasuke. Now that you have said I can see it. That was well done of you, Sasuke. Soon you and Master Elf behind us will enjoy the fable hospitality of the dwarves. Roaring fires. Malt beer. Red meat off the bone. He declared with joy as the path in front of them became clearer due to the light from Gandalf's crystal. This is the home of my cousin Balin, and they call it a mine. 
A mine. But the light from the crystal revealed things, horrible things. This is no mine, Boromir said in realization filled with horror. It's a tomb. Surrounding them were bodies of dead dwarves. They were everywhere, even on the stairs that lay in front of them. They had stumbled onto the site of a battle that the dwarves living in Moria had lost. No, Gimli said in horror when he saw the skeletons, for that was all that remained of their bodies. He quickly went over to one to see it closer and saw that dwarf had been killed by two arrows to the neck. The armor he wore and axe he wielded were all but brown from rust and cobwebs were spun all around him. Even his beard had turned into a mangy thing. And oh, oh howled the only living dwarf there. Legolas pulled out an arrow from one of the corpses to look at it closer. Goblins, he said, realizing the craftsmanship, which was to say, poor but cruel. The single word he said also served as a warning to everyone. Both Boromir and Aragorn drew their swords while he knocked an arrow to his bow. Sasuke stood at the ready with his sharingan blazing. Meanwhile, the hobbits had begun to back out of the mines. We make for the gap of Rohan, Boromir said in a grim but hard voice. We never should have come here. Now get out of here. Get out. That was when the next nasty surprise appeared. In one second, Frodo felt something wet and slippery grasp his leg. In the next second, it had yanked him off his feet and began dragging him to the water. He tried to get out, but the tentacle, which was what had the grasp on his leg, was strong. But the other hobbits had noticed what had happened. Crying out his name at roughly the same time, both Merry and Pippin grabbed hold of Frodo's arms and began pulling him back, creating a tug of war. Strider! cried out Sam, alerting Aragorn and the others to what was happening. The hobbit then leapt into action, drawing his blade and hacking away at the tentacle. Get off him! he yelled at it. Within two swings of his sword, the end of the tentacle was holding on by a flap of skin. It released its grasp on Frodo and withdrew to the water, disappearing beneath the surface. Both Pippin and Merry pulled their friend back, thinking that they were safe. But that feeling was incredibly short-lived when more tentacles burst out of the water, knocked three of the hobbits away, and grabbed the one it wanted, dragging him up into the air. Legolas stepped out of the doors, shooting the arrow he had knocked at the tentacle holding Frodo. But it did no good. Both Boromir and Aragorn were the water, cutting away at the other tentacles so they could get closer. Sasuke stood on the shore his right hand clutching his left wrist, waiting for the right moment. When the head of the beast commanding the tentacles emerged from the water and opened its gaping maw, Frodo screamed louder as he dangled in the air, realizing the implication. Boromir hurried his swing when he saw the same thing, cutting off a tentacle faster and making the creature wreathe in pain. Its wreathing allowed Aragorn to get to the hobbit-grasping tentacle and cut off. The grip it had on Frodo slackened and the hobbit fell down into the safety of Boromir's arms. Into the mines, cried out Gandalf, urging those who were on the shore through the doors. But the creature was not done nor was it going to give up its prize so easily. Legolas, shouted Boromir as he waded through the water carrying Frodo. The elf prince saw what he was silently asking for and promptly fired off an arrow, striking the creature in one of its eyes. It roared in pain and fell back slightly. Into the cave! shouted Aragorn as he got out of the water and raced towards the doors along with everyone else. Sasuke stood at the doors, pushing everyone else through. Go, go! he urged Aragorn, who was the last one through. His left palm was coated in lightning again, and he swung it wide. Chidori Samban! The Jutsu sprayed an uncountable number of the lightning Samban into the water shocking the creature immensely and with any luck, killing it. Seeing that his work was done, Sasuke fled into the mines. But the Watcher was not done either. Its tentacles grasped the doors of Durin, like it was going to pull itself out of the water and after them. But what happened was the doors broke apart and fell down, along what felt like the rest of the walls to the Fellowship, who watched it happen. The way out, as well as a good portion of the entranceway, were blocked by the collapse of the stone, covering them in darkness. Chapter 5 Sorrow-Filled Secrets Location Sasuke For a brief moment, he could see nothing, only the blackness before his eyes. It was comfortable feeling as he was most familiar with it. But the majority of the others were not, 
evident by how quickly they were breathing. We now have but one's choice, Gandalf announced as the light from the crystal atop his staff returned, letting the others see. We must face the long dark of Moria. He walked slowly forward, leading the way. Be on your guard, he warned the rest of the fellowship. There are older and fouler than orcs in the deep places in the world. That's not something we need to know right now, old man, Sasuke thought to himself as he walked forward, next to Legolas and in front of Gimli and the hobbits. Boromir and Aragorn covered the rear. They all treaded lightly as they walked, careful not to step on the dead. Quietly now, Gandalf told them in a whisper they could all hear. It's a four-day trip to the other side. Let us hope that our presence goes unnoticed. Everyone was hoping for that as well. But they climbed the stairs Gimli's curiosity got the better of him. Forgive me, Sasuke, he said to the man in front of him with a low voice. But I must know what exactly did you to the creature. What do you mean by that? Sasuke asked back just as quietly. I'm talking about the thing with the lightning in your hand. If you had such a thing to use, why did you not charge the creature when you had the chance instead of flinging it into the water? That's because I was thinking while I was fighting. Electricity can be conducted through water and every on dry land, so I thought it was safe to use. If the creature was still in the water when the electricity struck, it also would have been hit by the lightning. And the name of your weapon? asked the dwarf. The one you used to take care of the creature? That was called the Chidori Saban, he answered. So it's similar to what on you did on Karadras. Only in the sense that they are both lightning jutsus, he told Gimli as they finished climbing the stairs. Behind them, Boromir carefully took out a torch he found on the wall and quickly lit it, giving light to the back of the fellowship. Other than that, they are not similar. If there were any other questions he had, Gimli did not ask them at that moment. For they had walked through the short tunnel at the end of the staircase and entered into one of the largest areas Crabender had ever seen. The path that they were walking on did not go straight like an arrow. It twisted and curved around clusters, clumps, and natural spires, all from the stones surrounding them. What wasn't natural was still impressive. If he had to guess, the place they were walking through, with all its wooden scaffolding, bridges, and buckets dangling from wires, was one of the mining areas. He was not alone in his observations. The others looked around with silent awe on their faces. They were all impressed by what they were seeing. But the awe in their eyes and on their faces turned into something else, a look of wondering and unsureness. Sasuke knew what that look meant. The rest of the fellowship had a question on their minds, one he had himself. What would this place have been like when it alive with dwarves? It'd probably be less quiet, Sasuke told himself as they kept walking. The path had taken them away from the middle of the area and now had them walking alongside one of the rock walls. He could see how extensive the old dwarves had mined just by looking at the wall. There must have been a lot of gold or jewels in these mines for the dwarves to have dug so much, he commented quietly to the rest of the fellowship. That is where you would be wrong, Sasuke, Gandalf said as he pressed his hand lightly on a vein of metal in the rock. The wealth was not in gold, or jewels, but mithril. He lowered his staff and urged more light to come forth, allowing them all to see more of the mines. While Sasuke had seen a few mines in his years, they had all been made by men. And in the terms of how big and how deep those mines were, the dwarves had them beat. For the depth he saw now was completely bottomless, and he could not see the selling of this immense cave. Neither could he see the other side, but he put that down to how far the light was casted. But there was one thing that bothered him and he risked sounding like an idiot in asking it aloud. He still asked it. What exactly is Mithril? He asked as the light dimmed. He had read about it, but did not know the exact details of it were. It was Gimli who answered him. Mithril, lad, is the greatest prize to be treasured or crafted one could find in the world and for good reason. The dwarf began to explain it to him as they started walking again. It can be beaten like copper and polished like glass. In the hands of a dwarf, it can be forged into armor that was almost as light as the air and yet, harder than the strongest steel and iron. Unfortunately, Mithril has become quite rare these days, Gandalf said, entering the conversation. The last time I had seen any Mithril armor was a shirt of rings that Thorin had given Bilbo. I never told him this, but its worth was greater than the value of the Shire. Ah. 
That was kingly gift, Gimli conceded. But even that would have paled to what my cousin Balin and the dwarves that came with him were trying to create. What do you mean by that, Gimli? Mary asked him. After Madara was victorious in his duel against Smog, the company was eternally grateful to him. The thirteen dwarves sworn that if he asked one thing of them, they would gladly see it done. All he asked for was a suit of mithril armor done in the style of his homeland as his own was badly damaged and would later be destroyed in the Battle of the Five Armies. Alas, no such suit existed in the vast horde of smog, so the dwarves promised to forge one for him. And when a dwarf makes such a promise, he keeps it. Even after Madara had left Erebor and disappeared, they never let go of that promise, using what mithril they had to create this armor. One of the most important reasons Balin had tried to reclaim Moria was so they could use the mithril there to finish the armor, having taken it with them. It is an impressive tale, Gimli, Gandalf told him. But I doubt we will find any such armor here, finished or not. Let us focus more on reaching the other side of the mine safely. No one could argue that idea, so they kept quiet and followed his lead. The path he led them on was sometimes narrow and sometimes wide. It took them through narrow tunnels, small corridors, and wide areas of the mines, showing how far and much the dwarves had done in their time there. They climbed stairs and went down stairs while on the path, some were steep and some were not. A small thing that comforted them, Gimli most of all, was that as they walked the path, they did not see any more dead dwarves. It gave them hope that there were still some left alive. Since they could not see the sun or the sky, they had no proper sense of time. They walked for as far as they could and for as long as they could before finding a quiet place to camp for time. Since it was almost certain that they were not alone in the mines, they only made fires for when they absolutely needed them. They were a great help to those who stood, or rather sat, watch while the others slept. It was in such a scenario that Sasuke and Aragorn found themselves in, for they had drawn the lot of first watch that night and sat around the small fire, trying to keep themselves warm by it. For what felt like the longest time they sat in silence, not saying a word to each other. It was Aragorn who first broke the silence. Sasuke, I wish to speak to you about something, he said to the man sitting across the fire from him. What is it? Cravender asked him. About what you said in the cave during the storm, do you think that it is possible to do an evil act for good? The thought of that had silently plagued him ever since they had left that cave and came upon the walls of Moria. The shinobi nodded once. Yes, it is. But someone can also do a good act for evil. It was always important to remember that. But how then does one know when he does a good act for evil, or an evil act for good? He shrugged his shoulders in reply. That will depend on the person. On the person? Repeated a confused Aragorn, frowning slightly at those words. Despite what people might tell you, your future is not defined before you are born and there is no one definition for good or evil. You decide all of those things with a great and terrible thing, choice. That got him really confused. How could choice be a terrible thing to do? He demanded. I said great and terrible. Everything we do in this world is about choice. Why did we camp here instead of later or earlier? Why did we go to Moria instead of risking it at the Gap of Rohan? The choices we make are what define us in our lives, as well as our definitions of what's good and what's evil. He looked at the ranger. Why do you ask these questions? Aragorn hesitated before answering. I was thinking of Isildur and what he had done when he took the ring from Sauron's finger. I was wondering if he had actually been ensnared by the ring or if he chose to keep it. Tell me, was your ancestor friends with mine? Sasuke asked him. Yes, I believe so. Lord Elrond had often told me of the camaraderie they had in the last alliance. The Lord of Rivendell had also spoken of how the man they knew as Kage did nothing to stop Isildur from claiming the ring. Then perhaps they had the same conversation we are having. Perhaps Isildur had accepted what Inga had told him as truth. Perhaps he had been planning to become the one who shouldered the hatred and fear of being the ring bearer. Perhaps he had planned to become the third Dark Lord that others would know who their enemy was. Perhaps he had planned to do an evil act for good. That is an interesting to think about it, the heir to the throne of Gundor admitted. If Isildur had planned to do something like that, perhaps that meant he chose to do it, 
and his being killed at an ambush was just poor luck. It's up to you to choose to think of your ancestor, Aragorn. I only said perhaps. He looked at the raven-haired man. But I do not think that you would have come up with these answers by simply thinking on them. Something had happened to you in your past, didn't it? Sasuke scowled at him. That is none of your business. It is a simple question, Uchiha Sasuke, Gandalf said as his eyes opened to see the fire in front of him. How long have you been awake? The shinobi demanded, swinging his head around to look at the wizard. Not long. I only awoke after Aragorn had asked his question of you. Were you not going to answer his second question? It's none of your business either, old man, he snapped, getting angry. The wizard looked at him with eyes that seemed to be solemn and yet sad. It is a simple question, Sasuke. Those are usually the ones where you won't like the answer. He knew that all too well. Perhaps, Gandalf said, seemingly throwing his own words back at him. But I find that they are also the ones that bring friends and companions closer. And I do not believe that you wish to remain a stranger to this fellowship. How could I be a stranger when I've come this far with you all? If we set aside the fact that you are Madara's descendant and the fact that you have been in these lands for ten years, what do we really know about you? He stayed silent because he knew the answer to that. Nothing, they knew nothing about him. Fine, you want to know what happened, I'll tell you what happened. My older brother happened. And what did your brother do to make you think of such things? Slaughtered my entire clan and left me alive, he answered, taking a small pleasure in the looks of horror and shock on their faces. Do you want me to explain or would you like to stop there? Gandalf closed his eyes, took a deep breath, and opened them again. Continue, please. Seeing as how he was trapped by his own words, he had no choice. My brother, Itachi, was everything I wanted to be, for he was the perfect shinobi. Everyone respected and acknowledged him. I wanted to be him. Then one night when I came home late, I found my entire clan slaughtered and he was the one responsible. He left me alive because he thought I wasn't worth the effort. Because of that night, and what he said to me, I did not want to be him anymore. I wanted to kill him. He saw the looks on their faces, but kept going. That desire kept me going as I grew and trained. It grew even more after I saw him again and tried to attack him, only to be easily beaten. I was engulfed in my desire to kill my brother that I willingly abandoned my home and village to go to a traitor and learn from him. Once I had learned everything I needed from him, I betrayed him as well and left him for dead. I went looking for my brother and once I found him, I fought him. At the end of that fight, he was dead and I was alive. By the Vala, the wizard amongst them said quietly. He had been expecting something bad, he had seen it somewhat in how the shinobi spoke and held himself, but nothing like this. Oh, I haven't even gotten started yet, old man, he said, having heard him. When I had passed out and later awoken, I had been taken away by another member of my clan one who had been long thought dead and helped Itachi kill them all. He told me the reason why Itachi had slaughtered his own blood. There was a reason, Aragorn asked. He had seen his fair share of slaughters in his time, and he had come to believe that one did not need to have a reason to do so. Oh yes, there was a reason. You see, my clan had been planning to revolt because of a supposed insult. And since Itachi was working so close to the Hokage at the time, they used him to spy on the village but he was more loyal to the village than to the clan and became a double agent. When it became too late for negotiation of peace, the elders of the village ordered him to kill them all. And he did, with the exception of me. When I had learned of this, I promised to destroy the very village I had been born in, starting with the elders who ordered him to kill them. I even managed to kill one of them. It took to talking to the spirits of my dead brother, and the previous Hokages for me to realize what Itachi had truly done and give up my promise to destroy the village. Now I wish to destroy the entire world that I had known and rebuild it into something I believed to be better. At some point down the road that was my life, I had become what I had thought my brother was, a monster. They stared at him in silence for the longest time. You are not a monster, Sasuke, Aragorn finally said. For one, you do not look like it. Monster is another one of those words that have many meanings and definitions, Aragorn. And it isn't always about looks, he replied. 
If you wanted to destroy what you knew as the world and yet are here ten years later, I assume something happened? Gandalf asked. Whatever anger he had about them asking about his life burned out at those words, for he could still remember what happened that made him come to Middle-earth quite vividly. Yeah, something did. If there was any chance of my plan to recreate the shinobi world to be successful, I had to kill the person I considered to be my best friend. He was the only one who could have stopped me and he did. In the battleground where we had fought, he stood victorious over me at the end of it. He could have ended my life right then and there, and it was probably the better choice. But instead, he offered me his hand and when I took it, he pulled me back onto my feet and told me to leave. I did and in the ten years I had been in Middle-earth, I came to realize what I've told you all. My brother had been the one to bear the darkness, and I had planned to do so by recreating the shinobi world. Only I failed, but I know the darkness. When they stayed silent, he looked at them both. I expect both of you to not tell the others about this. They do not need to know about it, and it has nothing to do with our quest is. Of course, Aragorn said, nodding his head in agreement. I think you should be glad that you had such a good friend to allow you to live, Gandalf said to the raven-haired shinobi. Yeah, I am. He left at that, and so did they. He went to sleep when the next watch awoke, and when he woke up, it was time to get moving again. The path began to have more and more steep staircases, the kind where the shorter people in the fellowship had to climb it with both their hands and feet. It's a good thing we left Bill behind, Sam thought to himself as they climbed. When they got to the top of the steep staircase, they saw three corridors in front of them. Gandalf went up a few more steps before stopping and looking at the three corridors. I have no memory of this place, he declared. Everyone else knew that was not a good thing. They made a small fire to keep warm while they waited. Gandalf sat in front of the three corridors while Sasuke leaned against the nearby wall. Frodo was sitting against a smaller clump of rocks. When he made a causal look behind him, he saw something that made him turn around. There was something moving up the stairs, something small and was moving in and out of the shadows quickly. He went right up to Gandalf after losing it in the shadows. There's something down there, he said. It's Gollum, the wizard told him without taking his gaze off of the corridors. Gollum? He repeated, surprised to hear that word. But when Sasuke heard it, he came forward and looked down, his Sharingan alight and searching. He's been following us for three days, Gandalf said. He escaped the dungeons of Baradur, the hobbit said in realization. Escaped, or was set loose, the wizard corrected, finally looking at him. And now the ring has drawn him here. He won't ever be rid of his need for it. He hates and loves the ring, just as he hates and loves himself. Smeagol's life is a sad one. He noticed the look on Frodo's face. Yes, Smeagol he was once called before the ring found him, before it drove him mad. It's a pity Bilbo didn't kill him when he had the chance, the hobbit spat, casting a look back down the stairs. Both Gandalf and Sasuke looked at him sharply when they heard those words. Pity? repeated Gandalf. It was pity that stayed Bilbo's hand. Many that live deserve death, and some that die deserve life. Can you give it to them, Frodo? The hobbit had no answer to give back to him. Do not be deal death and judgment. Even the very wise cannot see all ends. My heart tells me that Gollum has some part to play yet, for good or ill, before this is all over. He's leaving, Sasuke quietly told them. He watched as the creature below slipped away, deactivating his Sharingan. The pity of Bilbo may rule the fate of many, the wizard said to the hobbit. Frodo looked unsure, so the shinobi spoke. Frodo, Never hate someone to an extent that you wish to kill them. You'll become them in their place if you do. The Grey Wizard gave him a look, one that he did not return. The ringbearer seemed to deflate a little and sat down next to them. I wish the ring had never come to me, he confessed. I wish none of this had happened. Right now, he wished that he could be back in the Shire, living in Bag and in peace. So do all who live to see such times— but that is not for them to decide, Gandalf told him. All we have to decide is what to do with the time given to us. There are other forces at work in this world, Frodo, besides the will of evil. Bilbo was meant to find the ring, in which case you were also meant to find it to have it. And that is an encouraging thought. 
I would say it's more of a reminder than an encouragement, Sasuke remarked, earning their attention. What makes you say that, Sasuke? Frodo asked him. I know what you're feeling, Frodo, even if I'm not carrying the ring. What you're feeling is that you don't think you can do this. That the goal you've sent out for is impossible, and that would be for the best to turn around and walk away. But the minute you turn, you've lost. Then what should I do? It's something very simple. All you have to do is remember why you've come this far and then, take a step forward. Then another step, and another, and another until you've started walking again. He had felt like that a few, a very few, times when he had trained to kill Itachi. His reminder was that night, and it was enough for him to keep going. Very wise words, Sasuke, Gandalf said to him. I see you have your own wisdom about how to keep moving forward. Yeah, I do, he admitted, looking away from the wizard. It was strange, but ever since this journey had begun, the old man began to feel like a weird mixture of the Sandame Hokage and Itachi. He wasn't exactly sure how to deal with that, and a small part of him suggested that he start calling the wizard by his name, for he had certainly earned it. It's certainly a sad and scary thing to hear how to keep moving from one who has never carried this burden, Frodo remarked, only realizing that he might have made it sound like an insult too late. But if Crabender heard as an insult, he did not show it on his face. No, the sad and scary thing is that you got it from the youngest person in this fellowship, he replied. The look on the hobbit's face was one of both surprise and shock. What? Are you sure? He couldn't help but ask. The raven-haired man nodded once. I'm twenty-seven. He didn't know whether he should laugh or not. He never would have guessed that the man from Southern Earth would be the youngest of them all. The way he held himself, and the way he spoke made him seem to be much older. But he was younger than Pippin, who was the youngest of the four hobbits. Thankfully for him, Gandalf stopped him from making a choice by saying, Oh! Both eyes looked to him when he said that. It's that way! He told them, gesturing to one of the corridors. The declaration got the attention of the rest of the fellowship. He remembered, Mary said, standing up and putting his pipe away. As the rest of the fellowship gathered up around the wizard, Sam quickly put out the fire. No, but the air doesn't smell so foul down, Gandalf replied as he stood before the corridor entrance, putting his hat back on his head. If in doubt, Maria Doc, always follow your nose. I think I'll stick to my eyes, Sasuke thought to himself as they started down the steps in the corridor. It was less than the stairs they had climbed up to get here, so they were able to go down easier than they had come up. The light from Gandalf's staff was the only light they had. The further they down, the less they saw of the light from the corridor entrance. But the only person who felt comfortable in the darkness that was all around was Sasuke. He hung back a little, staying halfway between the light and the dark. When they got to the bottom, all they saw was great darkness before them. Let me risk a little more light, the wizard amongst them said quietly, urging more light from the crystal. It worked and the darkness was pierced, letting them see what was there. Behold the great realm of dwarf city of Dwarodelf. The light revealed giant ornate columns made of stone that went from ceiling, which was very high up, to floor and they stretched out for miles and miles. Truly, it was all they could see and it astounded them. Sam summed up what they felt of the sight. There's an eye-opener, and no mistake. Yes it is, Sam, Sasuke agreed that they began walking forward, into the forest of columns. Remind me to never bring Shinobi from IWA here. Odds are they would try to destroy it. And why would your people want to destroy such a thing? Gimli asked him, a warning tone in his voice. They're not my people. They're from the land of earth. I was from the land of fire and they would probably do it out of jealousy. That statement earned him looks of confusion, both small and great, so he had to explain. Shinobi who hail from Awadakure, the village hidden by rocks, are considered to be the masters of Dotan, which means earth style in your common tongue, Jutsus. All of this would make them look like amateurs. He gestured at all the columns they were walking through to emphasize his point. Then as the representative of the dwarves currently in Khazad-dum, I will take pride in that they would show envy at something great, Gimli declared. Now tell me, Master Elf, are you impressed by what you see? He asked Legolas. Yes, I am, the Elf Prince admitted. I have never seen anything like this before in my long life. 
The dwarf grinned when he heard those words, proud to have gotten the elf to admit that the dwarves could build something that would astound him. His grin faded away when he saw a nearby door that had light emitting from it. With a short gasp of surprise and hope, he started running towards it. Gimli! called out Gandalf. But he did not listen. He just ran into the room, hope speeding his way. But his hope and speed disappeared when he saw that in the room was a tomb. The light he had seen shined down on the inscription on the tomb. No, he said, making it sound like a wish and a prayer. But neither would come true. He could read the inscription perfectly, and he knew the double-bladed axe that lay on the tomb, having seen it when he had been young. No, he said again, taking a knee. No. Tears began to well up in his eyes. The rest of the fellowship came into the room, looking around at the number of skeletons lying around the tomb. Gandalf went straight up to the tomb and read the inscription. Here lays Balin, son of Fundin, lord of Moria. He looked at the axe. That is the axe his father gave him when he came of age. I, Gimli agreed with a voice full of emotion. He never really used it, claiming that it felt heavy and cumbersome in his hands. He always preferred his flat-bladed mace. The mention of the weapon seemed like the last straw for the dwarf. The tears began to fall and he cried. He is dead then, the wizard declared, taking off his hat. It is as I feared. They all stood at the tomb and gave it a moment of silence. The only sound that was made was Gimli and his tears. Once the moment was done, Sasuke began looking around. The place was clearly the site of a battle, one that the dwarves had lost. Perhaps even a last stand. If that was true, they must have been on their last legs. He couldn't help but wonder if they didn't leave because they couldn't or they would not leave their lord behind. He had a feeling that it would have been the latter. The dwarves seemed to be the loyal kind, if his watching Gimli and reading about them was anything to go by. As he looked around, something caught his eye. What is that? He asked himself as he looked at the corner where the something was. Whatever it was, it was covered in cobwebs and dirt. Meanwhile, Gandalf had begun looking around as well. He noticed that one of the dwarf skeletons next to the tomb held a large tome in its hands. He gave his staff and his hat to Pippin so his hands would be free. When he bent down to pick the tome up, he stopped in realization. He recognized the dwarf before him. Oh, Ori, I am so sorry for your end, he said. When Gimli heard those words, more tears leaked from his eyes. As the wizard took the tome and blew dust off of it, Legolas turned to Aragorn. We must move on, he said. We cannot linger. They have taken the bridge in the second hall, Gandalf began to read aloud. He frowned and placed his finger on the page, running through the words until he found the next readable ones. Owen's party went five days ago but today only four return. The pool is up to the wall at Westgate. The watcher in the water took Owen. Gimli began to weep again at those words. Not only had he lost his cousin, but his uncle too. Still, Gandalf kept reading. At last, promise fulfilled to, has been stored in the chamber of Mazarbal, shame it will never see, light of day. He looked up from the tome. I do not know what he means by these words. I think I do, Sasuke said, loud enough for them all to hear. They turned to where he was and saw him picking off cobwebs and wiping off dirt from something on an armor stand. It didn't take him long to finish, and they could all see what he had been cleaning. Gimli had risen to his feet when he saw it. By the beard of Durin and the beards of my ancestors, Balin actually did it. He breathed out with wonder and surprise in his voice. A suit of mithril armor has been made. And it's definitely in the style of the elemental nations, the shinobi amongst them thought to himself. A samurai would be hard-pressed to find a rival to it. Each piece of armor gleamed white in the faint light shone upon it. The color was silver-white with only one exception the red half of the Uchiha fan that was emblazoned on the back of the dew. The dwarves must have taken good notes from Madara because the armor he was looking at was an exact replica of old samurai armor, the kind his ancestor knew. It was flawless. There was no other way to describe it. Without even thinking over, Sasuke pulled out a scroll, laid it on the floor, and began removing the armor from the stand crabender. What are you doing? Legolas asked him. I'm taking it with us. Such armor shouldn't waste away in the dark, he answered. He might not have learned a lot about Fuinjutsu when he was learning from Orochimaru, apparently, 
That had been Jiraiya's area, but he knew how to do a basic storage seal. Once he had all the pieces of the armor on the scroll, he simply channeled his chakra through it and sealed the armor into the scroll. By Eru, the elf prince said when he saw this happen. Don't be too surprised. That was something basic, he told them as he stood back up, the scroll disappearing into a sleeve of his coat. Gandalf turned back to the tome. We have barred the gates, but cannot hold them for long. The ground shakes, drums, drums in the deep. He looked at the fellowship, seeing the unease in their faces, before turning the page. As he did, Pippin had backed into the well in the room and saw the dwarf sitting on it, an arrow embedded in his chest. We cannot get out. The shadow moves in the dark. We cannot get out. He lifted his head from the page to look at everyone else. They are coming. At that moment, Pippin, driven by his curiosity, touched the arrow and twisted. In doing so, the skull of the dead dwarf fell off and into the well. The loud noise made everyone turn towards it. The body went next, as did the chain and finally, the bucket. The noise that they made falling through the well echoed throughout the chambers and the rest of the mines. All the while, Pippin stood there with a guilty expression on his face. Chapter 6 Extracting and Paying a Wurgild Location, the Fellowship For the longest moment, no one said anything. Then Gandalf did. Fool of a took! He declared, snapping the tome shut and placing it on the tomb before yanking his staff and hat out of Pippin's grasp. Throw yourself in next time and rid us of your stupidity. I'm sorry, I, Pippin tried to say. Pippin, don't, Sasuke told him, cutting him off. There's nothing you could say that will fix what you've done. I'm sorry, he said again before falling silent. But in silence, they heard something come up from the well, the sound of drums. It was slow at first. But then it began to get louder and then, it diversified. One series of drums would sound off and another would reply. Once all the drums had been sounded, they began to beat as one again. And with this rejoining of drums, distant sounds that were like voices echoed all around them. They looked around the room, trying to figure out where the voices were echoing from. Sasuke tried to listen, but they kept echoing off the walls, making it seem they were everywhere. Whatever it is, it sounds like a lot of them, he thought to himself. As the drums faded away and the voices grew, a bad feeling grew inside of Frodo. He reached down for Sting and drew it slightly out of its sheath. It glowed blue. Frodo, said Sam, seeing the glowing blade. Everyone else saw the blade as well. At that exact moment, the echoing voices swelled into a chorus that did not sound right to their ears. Orcs, declared Legolas. Boromir was the first to act running to the door to see what was coming towards them. Sasuke followed him and pulled him just slightly back so that the arrows that were shot at the door did not pierce him. You okay? He asked the man from Gundor. I am fine, Boromir replied. His attention stayed focused on what was coming their way, despite the arrows that were lodged in the door. The raven-haired shinobi saw the same thing. He unsealed a kunai, attached an explosive tag, which only left him with one, for he had used the rest of the small amount sparingly over the ten years, to it, and through it. The resulting explosion only faintly rattled the room, shaking loose a few cobwebs here and there. Did that get him? he asked. The smoke cleared quickly enough. I would say no, the captain general replied. Get back, Aragorn told the four hobbits. Stay close to Gandalf. As the wizard ushered the four of them back, the ranger tossed down the torch he was carrying and went for the door, joining Boromir and Sasuke there. Between the three of them, they managed to close the door fast enough to only hear a distant bellow. They have a cave troll, Boromir declared. So that was that was, Sasuke thought to himself, having read about trolls. He thought it'd be a bit smaller. Maybe it was the distance. Toss some of those axes over here, Legolas, he told the elf prince. We need to barricade the door. Legolas did so, tossing two long-shafted axes at Aragorn and Boromir, who immediately wedged them along the lock on the door. Sasuke grabbed two pikes and placed them against the doors themselves, adding weight to the barricade. It wasn't much of a barricade and it wouldn't hold long, as the banging on the door indicated. But it held long enough for them to back up and prepare themselves, 
Aragorn and Legolas drawing their bows and knocking arrows, Boromir unslinging his shield from his back onto his arm, and Sasuke drawing out his Jakuto. Tossing his hat aside, Gandalf drew Glamdring with a war cry, the blade glowing just like Sting. In response, the hobbits drew their swords as well. Gimli had climbed up onto his cousin's tomb, taking the battle axe in hand. Ack! He shouted ready for a fight. Let them come! There is one dwarf yet in Moria who still draws breath. The banging against the door soon turned into chopping, making the eyes of the hobbits go wide in realization. They're hacking down the door. Frodo thought with no small amount of fear. The goblins that were outside the door were indeed trying to get in by chopping it down. At first, a few splinters fell off but those splinters got bigger and bigger as the chopping sounds went on. Before long, a point of crudely forged weapon cut a hole through the door. There was one hole and then there was another, and then another, each bigger than the last. Still, those in the fellowship with bows did not react. Finally, there was a big enough of a hole for an entire spear shaft to go through with ample space left behind. Legolas fired off his arrow into the hole, killing the goblin holding the spear with a screech. Not one to waste time, he pulled out another arrow. Aragorn fired off an arrow himself in that time, killing another goblin. But by the time Legolas had knocked another arrow, the door was broken open and the goblins flooded in. Both Legolas and Aragorn got in a few more arrows, even managing to pierce one of them through a goblin's nose, but the goblins had reached them after that. As Gimli bellowed out a war cry and Aragorn drew his sword, Sasuke caught a blade with his own and swiftly beheaded the goblin facing him. One down, he thought. The battle quickly became chaotic. When Gandalf shouted out a war cry and charged into the fray, the four hobbits behind him did the same. They proved quite the capable fighters, using the advantage of their height, as they were smaller than the goblins, against their foes. Pippin seemed to be especially ferocious. When the others saw him fight, they would later think that he was trying to make up for his mistake. At times, the separate members of the fellowship felt that they were alone in a sea of goblins. While they could see the others, they kept getting obscured by the goblins. The only who didn't have this problem was Gimli, as he was still standing on the tomb and swinging at any goblin that was stupid to get close, and goblins were never known for their size of brains. At one point, Sasuke found himself beside Pippin and noticed the aggressive way the hobbit fought. Keep a cool head, Pippin, the shinobi told him sharply. You're liable to end up dead if you don't. The Took didn't say anything in reply, but he began to fight less aggressively after hearing those words. Crabender nodded in acknowledgement to him but then had to return to the fighting, lest he was killed by a lack of paying attention, and that was not the way he was going to die. His Chikudo was an immense help to him, as its superior craftsmanship damaged many of the goblins' weapons, which at best could only be called crude. He wasn't even a weapons prude and he could tell that. The looks of surprise the goblins had on their faces when they saw their weapons all but destroyed always gave him enough time to kill them. If it wasn't for the fact that he was practically surrounded and more kept coming in, his sword and his sharingan would have made this easy. He paid no real attention to the others as he fought, save to mark their location and try to come to their aid if they needed, like Pippin. But one of them paid attention to him. It happened when one of the goblins aimed for his head with a weapon. He held the weapon in check with his own, but was a little surprised to see that the weapon was made of bronze and good quality too. Stay your blade, Sasuke, and send that one to me. Gimli shouted out at him. Why would I do that when I can kill him right here? He shouted back while also burying his foot in the face of another goblin, crushing it. He's wielding my cousin's mace. I mean to mean to teach him why he shouldn't have done that. The dwarf explained shortly while he also beheaded a goblin who had tried to hack off his legs. That was fair enough. Here you go. He broke the hold with the goblin, grabbed him by the shoulders, surprising him, and shoved him to the son of Gloin. The goblin shrieked at the dwarf and tried to use the weapon he had stolen from a dead dwarf's tomb, for the weapon to be knocked from his grasp by one axe. And while he stared with a stunned expression at his hand, his head was removed by the other axe. That was for Balin, Gimli declared. In the midst of the fighting, Sam broke free of the flood and found himself near the door. 
He would have moved to return to the fighting but paused when he heard something he had never heard before. Both Aragorn and Boromir looked to the door, having heard the sound many times before. Being led into the chamber on a chain pulled by two goblins, was the cave troll Boromir spoke of before the fighting began. Hefting a rather crude club, the troll roared at everything in there. Huh, he's big, Sasuke silently noted, already analyzing everything about the creature with the Sharingan. Legolas didn't waste any time in firing off an arrow at the troll, hitting it in the lower shoulder. But that only made it angrier. Roaring again, it took a few steps forward and saw Sam. When the hobbit saw the troll raise its hammer, he shouted in equal parts fear and adrenaline and then leapt in between the troll's legs, just as the hammer came down. When the troll turned around to find the crawling hobbit, Sasuke could already see what it was planning to do. Not good. Trying to think of and find a way to stop it from happening, his eyes fell on the chain, still being held by the goblins. With two swift strokes, he killed them and the chain fell to the ground. Aragorn, Boromir. He shouted to the two men as he grabbed the chain. Help me out. They saw what he was trying to do and quickly fought their way over to the chain, grabbing hold of it. Pull! Aragorn ordered as the troll raised its foot to squash Sam. The three of them pulled as hard as they could, and it worked. The chain was attached to a collar on the troll's neck. It pulled the toll back a step or two away from Sam, allowing the hobbit to get away safely. It roared as it was pulled back and turned around, swinging the club at the people holding the chain. Both Aragorn and Sasuke had let go of the chain when they saw it start to turn. But Boromir was still holding on when the club was swung. He ducked and avoided it but became slightly dazed in the process, and when he stood back up he realized too late that he was still holding the chain. The troll saw him still holding on and swung the chain with its free hand, making the man from Gundor drop his sword as he was flung toward a wall. He crashed against the wall and landed briefly on the upper level before falling back down to the floor. He was still dazed when he saw a goblin standing over him with a blade raised with obvious intent. His life would have ended right then, and there had Aragorn not thrown his sword into the goblin's neck. Shaking himself out of the daze, he looked at the ranger, who gave him a brief nod before going back to the fight. He pulled his sword out of the goblin and joined the fight again. When he let go of the chain, Sasuke had tried to get in close to the troll and eliminate it. But the goblins must have realized that he was the greatest danger of the ten, and so swarmed him, pushing him away from the troll and keeping him busy. Help, please, he called out. I am coming, Gandalf assured him, starting to fight his way through the goblins to his side. Merry, Pippin, keep Frodo safe, the wizard told the two hobbits. They nodded in acknowledgement and fought their way over to the ring-bearer. Once they were by his side, they moved to a safe part of the upper levels. Legolas, who had climbed up there on the opposite side of the room, saw them and began fighting his way towards them. When he saw the troll coming his way, Gimli threw one of his smaller axes at it. It struck it in the shoulder, actually splitting Legolas's previous arrow in half, but it only made the troll angrier. When he saw the club rise up, Gimli knew there was only one option left to him. Forgive me, cousin, he silently prayed before leaping off the tomb just as the club smashed it to pieces, desecrating it. Thankfully, the tome had flown off the tomb had landed safely and yet, ironically, in the grasp of a dead goblin. He got back up and fought off the nearby goblins while also trying to stay from the troll, who was following him and swinging the club. The swings were wild and were more inclined to hit goblins rather than the dwarf. But when Gimli stumbled away from a goblin's sword and fell to the ground, the troll seemed to have him. That is, until Legolas knocked two arrows to his bow and shot them at the troll. They hit the big creature with such a force that it fell back almost tripping over its own chain, and dropped its hammer. Gimli, now safe from immediate troll danger, got back up to his feet and attacked the goblins again. The elf was still trying to fight his way over to the hobbits, when the troll took notice of him. It began to swing its chain in the air like a whip, aiming for the elf. When Legolas saw the incoming chain, he ducked and avoided it. Two more times the troll swung its chain and he dodged it each time. It was on the fourth time that he got lucky. The chain wrapped itself around one of the pillars after missing him. Acting quickly, Legolas placed his boot on the chain, stopping the troll from pulling it free. 
Using his agility and speed, he ran up the chain onto the top of the troll. Keeping his balance on the struggling creature, he knocked an arrow and shot it directly at the troll's head. It did nothing, except shatter the arrow and make the troll mad enough to snap free of the chain while the elf leapt off and landed back on the ground. Did he really think that would work? Sasuke asked himself as he tried to fight his way out of the goblins swarming around him, which was somewhat working with help from Gandalf. He knew that shooting directly at the head on a creature like that would be next to impossible. The bone would be too thick. The sound of a pan hitting something filled the shinobi's ears. He looked over to where the sound was coming from and saw a particular sight. Sam had taken a frying pan out of the gear on his back and was banging goblins on the head with it. It was effective as the goblins were stunned long enough for the hobbit to stab them. I think I'm getting the hang of it, Sam said aloud, but to himself. Had that been any other time, Sasuke might have permitted himself a chuckle and a small smirk at those words. But it wasn't any other time, and he had a swarm to cut through. He did, however, make a small note to himself. Never introduce that hobbit to the women of the Nara clan. Then he noticed something else. Where did the troll go? His answer came in the form of Pippin, who had shouted in fright. As he and Mary were trying to keep Frodo out of harm's way, the troll found them and made its way over to them, rising its club and then bringing it down onto the part of the upper level they were standing on, making them split apart by jumping away from the club. Mary and Pippin to one side and Frodo to the other. Guys! The shinobi shouted out to any in range who heard him. Aragorn heard him and also saw the troll. Frodo. He called out to the hobbit and began fighting his way over to him. Sasuke did the same, cutting through the swarm, which had less numbers now. As the troll began looking for the single hobbit, its tiny brain realized the fact that one was easier to catch than two. Frodo hid behind a column. He looked beyond the edge a little to see the troll. When he saw that it pulled back and he saw its hand change its grip, he knew that it would check the other side. So when its head disappeared, he quickly went around two sides to hide again. It was successful, and the troll didn't see him. When it pulled back again, he moved again. However, he only moved to the next side. He looked beyond the edge, saw nothing, and breathed a sigh of relief. However, he did not think a troll would ever consider the notion of double-checking. But the troll did, and it also knew the concept of surprise for it threw its head into the hobbit's sight and roared in his face, making him yelp in surprise and fall to the ground on his back. As the troll reached for him, he tried to back away only to back himself into the corner. The troll grabbed a hold of him and tried to pull him down to the lower level. He tried to grab hold of something that would stop this from happening, but found nothing. Aragorn. Sasuke. He cried out for help. Aragorn, who at some point had snatched a spear from one of the goblins, was the closer of the two and he was able to see the danger the hobbit was in. Frodo. He shouted out as he fought his way over. Sasuke could see the danger too and fought harder, almost free of the swarm. Just as the troll was about to pull him off the upper level, the hobbit struck its hand with Sting, making it release its grip on him. The downsides of that idea were that he fell to the lower level, and the troll did not pay much attention to the small wound on its hand. It raised a club, intent on bringing it down on the hobbit. That was when Aragorn leapt down with the spear and stabbed it into the troll's torso. The troll screamed in pain and dropped its club. Both Pippin and Merry tried to help Aragorn by throwing stones at the troll. Sasuke had gotten free of the swarm that had been hounding him and raced toward the troll. Merry! Pippin! Behind you! He shouted up to the stone-throwing hobbits. A group of goblins were heading for the two hobbits, hoping to take them unawares. But they heard the shinobi's words and turned to the group with their swords ready. Seeing that they were taking care of themselves, Sasuke turned his attention back to the troll, who still had the spear stuck in its torso with Aragorn holding it there. The shinobi dived into a roll with his chikudo at the ready, aiming for just underneath the troll's legs. The idea he had was that if he managed to pierce of the legs, and by channeling his lighting chakra through the sword, he could probably saw the leg off in a matter of seconds. But as the troll kept moving around and trying to get the spear out, the position of Sasuke's roll became misplaced and he realized it too late, just when he came out of the roll and thrust his sword upwards. Because of the misplacement, 
the sword had pierced something else and thus, history was made. For never before in the years of Middle-earth had anyone shoved a sword up a troll's ass. As he stared up at where he had placed the sword, with his hand still gripping it, nonetheless, the only thought Sasuke had was, this is something Naruto would do, not me. With a roar of pain, the troll knocked Aragorn away, sending him right into a nearby column and knocking him unconscious. Not wanting to get stepped on, Sasuke pulled out the sword and got out of the way in the opposite direction of Aragorn. But that turned out to be a bad idea. Frodo had crawled over to Aragorn and tried to shake him awake while the troll finally yanked out the spear. When it didn't work, he tried to get out of the confined area, only to have the troll block his path with the spear. The troll then pushed him back up against the wall and then stabbed him in the chest. It was the gasp of pain that drew the attention of the conscious members of the fellowship. When the spear embedded in Frodo's chest, the world seemed to slow down and then stop. The troll seemed to sneer at the hobbit one last time before releasing its grip on the spear. Merry and Pippin, who were still on the upper level, grasped their swords in a reverse grip and leapt onto the back of the troll with a shout. Once they on the troll, they began stabbing it in the back. The troll roared pain and began to spin around, trying to get them off. Sam could only stand in his place and look at his master and friend. Frodo, he said in shocked horror, only a getting a groan of pain in response. Frodo! He shouted, rushing towards the hobbit. He fought with a rage he didn't he had, using both sword and pan to devastating effect. In fact, the sight of Frodo brought a similar rage to everyone still fighting, hence, why Merry and Pippin had jumped onto the troll, which scared the rest of the goblins out of the room. It only intensified when Frodo fell to the ground, the spear still embedded in his chest. Both Merry and Pippin held on to the troll as they kept stabbing it, even as it kept swerving around, trying to reach them. It got lucky and grabbed Merry by his legs, holding him upside down in the air. He had dropped his sword and was screaming for help while it felt like his legs were about to be crushed. The others saw his plight and rushed to attack the dwarf. Boromir stayed to the back perimeter so the troll could not escape while Gimli, Gandalf, Legolas, and Sasuke attacked. They were forced to dart in and out so they could avoid the reach of the troll's arms. But because of this tactic, most of their strikes did not hit the troll. Gimli was the first one to strike it, slicing an axe through its thigh while its back was turned to him. The troll whirled around, briefly touching the wound with the free hand, and then pulled it back to anchor for a swipe. That was when Gandalf struck, slicing a wound open on its side. In its surprise, the troll let go of Merry who fell to the floor with a thud and pained groan. Gandalf struck again before moving back and then Gimli moved forward to strike. But while he got one, the troll struck back and sent him crashing to the floor. Legolas had an arrow knocked and aimed at the troll, but it saw the arrow and took a swipe at the elf, forcing him back. Trying to get in close to pierce the troll, Sasuke had an idea and backed off. Pippin, make him scream! He told the hobbit still on the troll while pulling a knife and his last explosive tag. Pippin did as he was ordered and stabbed the troll in the neck, making it bellow in pain. The minute its mouth was open, Sasuke threw the knife into the maw and saw it pierce the roof of the mouth. Jump off! He shouted at Pippin. The hobbit did jump off and just in time too. The head of the troll exploded with such a sound that it rattled the ceiling. Whatever blood and guts that spewed out of the gap where its head used to be was small and hit only the ceiling. The now headless troll fell to the ground, dead. But their attention was not on the troll, it was Frodo. Aragorn, who had regained consciousness, crawled to him. Oh no, he said in a quiet voice while Sam looked on. But when he reached out and rolled Frodo over, the hobbit let a groan breath of life. Sam was instantly at his side, seeing if there was anything wrong. He's alive, he declared to the rest of the fellowship, deeply relieved. I'm all right, Frodo said, panting slightly as he sat up. I'm not hurt. You should be dead, Aragorn told him. That spear would have skewered a wild boar. I think there's more to this hobbit than meets the eye, Gandalf remarked with the faintest hint of a smile on his face. Frodo was already going for his shirt, undoing the first couple of buttons to show them what was beneath it. Mithril, said Gimli as he looked at the shirt of the precious metal Frodo was wearing. You are full of surprises, Master Baggins. 
Whatever else could have been said at that moment was overridden by the screeching of goblins. They all looked to the smashed door and saw the growing shadows of reinforcements. To the bridge of Khazad-dum, announced Gandalf. They all stood up to run. Wait, cried Gimli as he ran over to one of the goblin corpses and took the tome from its grasp. This must go back to King Dane. He must know of what happened here. Sasuke went to his side, pulling out the same scroll he had sealed the armor in. Give it here, he ordered the dwarf, unwrapping the scroll to a free space. Gimli placed the tome on the scroll and it was quickly sealed. Now let's go. They ran out of the chamber through a hole near the back, just right of where the light was shining through. But as they ran, the goblins returned in force, a much bigger force. They could hear the screeching behind them, and when one of them looked back, one of the hobbit mostly, they could see the horde following them. It was enough to make them not look back. But that wasn't all they were coming from. They also came out of the floor and the ceiling, crawling down the columns like spiders in a web. As they ran, it became more and more obvious that they were becoming surrounded. It was soon proven true when they found that the only open space they had left was the circle of light that emitted from Gandalf's staff. This does not bode well for us, Gimli said. But I plan to take many goblins with me. Don't be so sure of that, Sasuke told him, his Sharingan alight and searching. Gandalf, how far away are we to the bridge? He asked the wizard. Gandalf looked at him. The passage is just over there, he answered with a jerk of his head in a direction. In that direction, past the horde of goblins, was a doorway. All right then, I'll probably be able to carve a path to there. But all of you will have to stay close. He took a deep breath to ready himself. What are you planning to do, Sasuke? Boromir asked him. Something I haven't done in over a decade. He sheathed his sword and began to channel his chakra when things changed. A low growl that seemed to engulf the entirety of the cavernous hall filled the air. From one end, a dark smoky orange started to appear. But that was not what surprised the fellowship. What surprised them was the fact that the goblins were now scared. Shrieks of terror and confusion began to fill the air all around them as the goblins looked upwards, trying to figure out what was happening. Another growl, louder this time, filled the air and the confusion was quickly replaced with just terror. They scattered running back into the cracks in the floor and ceiling from where they came. Gimli shouted triumphantly at their backs as they ran. But even his shouts faded away when the goblins disappeared and all that was left the smoky orange glow. A slow growl dragged through the air, feeling longer than what it was to the ears of the fellowship. Now that the goblins were all gone, their focus was on the glow that was slowly but steadily approaching them. Legolas had an arrow knocked and pointed at the glow, but his hands were trembling showing how uncertain he was of the glow. He wasn't alone in that feeling. What is this new devilry? Boromir asked Gandalf, standing behind the wizard. He did not answer right away. Instead, he closed his eyes and the fellowship waited for his answer. Legolas had lowered the bow and put the arrow back in his quiver. Sasuke had seen the look on Gandalf's face before. It was the same kind of face Orochimaru or even Kakashi had worn while they were in deep concentration but there was a subtle difference between them and the gray wizard. If the raven-haired shinobi had to guess, he would say the old man was reaching out with his mind, or something close to that idea. It must have been the case, for the growl returned, louder and more menacing, just as Gandalf opened his eyes again. A Balrog, as demon of the ancient world, he finally answered Boromir's question. For those who knew what that was, looks of terror appeared in their eyes. When he said those words, the glow kept coming closer. Sasuke had a chilling thought. Why were they seeing any shape or form of a body? Was it so immense that the glow actually was ahead of the body? This foe is beyond any of you, Gandalf told them all. If he wasn't distracted by the glow, Sasuke might have disagreed with that sentiment. Run! That single shout set them off, running towards the doorway the wizard had pointed out to the shinobi. Whatever was coming their way seemed to notice, as they heard a loud roar at their backs. But no one wanted to look to see if there was a body that came with that roar. They just kept running. When they got to the doorway, Gandalf and Aragorn ushered the others through it, pushing them through with their hands. Boromir took the lead through the passage, going down the steps quickly. 
But when he came out into a large cavern, he realized almost too late that the staircase that went straight down was gone. He stopped on the last step, failing his arms somewhat to maintain his balance, dropping the torch he was carrying into the abyss. Legolas pulled him back away from the abyss, and they fell back onto the staircase. Now is not the time to be lying around, Dimly told the two of them even as he helped them back onto their feet. Take the stairs to the side, the side. Those who heard him immediately went to the side stairs. Sasuke and Aragorn were still at the passageway, waiting for the last member of the fellowship. Gandalf, said Aragorn, grabbing the wizard's shoulder when he looked like he was about to fall. Lead them on, Aragorn, Gandalf told him. The bridge is near. Both the ranger and the shinobi looked at what he talking about. The ranger looked to argue, but the wizard would have none of it. Do as I say. Swords are no more use here. They ran down the side staircase, Sasuke taking to the back. As it turned, the fellowship realized that its path went in the same direction as the broken staircase Boromir almost fell off. The growl of the unseen Balrog kept their feet moving. But their feet stopped when they came to a gap that had broken the staircase. Legolas was the first to jump across, landing on the other side and then looking back up. The sound of something slamming into the rock filled their ears, making them look back. The passageway came alight with the orange glow, and rocks began to fall from the ceiling. Gandalf, urged Legolas. The wizard looked back to the stairs and jumped just as they heard another roar. He landed safely, but then arrows started flying. They all looked at where the arrows were coming from and saw a group of goblins on a faraway ledge with bows knocked with arrows. One arrow struck the step just beneath the feet of Merry and Pippin. Both Legolas and Sasuke reacted, the elf with his own bow and Sasuke with his stash of knives sealed away in his wrist. Merry! Pippin! shouted Boromir just before he grabbed the two hobbits and leapt. They landed safely, but the portion of stair they had been on broke off and fell into the abyss. The gap between the two stairs was now much larger, and jumping wasn't that easy anymore. The goblins kept up their assault, forcing Legolas and Sasuke to respond in kind. Sasuke had to be careful. He was running out of knives and it didn't look like the goblins would be stopping. Sam, Aragorn called out to the hobbit, grabbing hold of him, and then tossed him to the other side, where Boromir was able to catch him. When the ranger went to do the same thing with Gimli, the dwarf stopped him with a raised hand. Nobody tosses a dwarf, he declared before leaping with a shout. He landed wrong and Legolas had to grab him by the beard to keep him from falling. Not the beard, he instantly protested. He was still pulled to safety by the elf. Aragorn had pulled out his own bow and fired off one of his own arrows just as the stairs beneath him began to give way. Frodo. He called to the hobbit, pushing him up the stairs. Sasuke helped by grabbing Frodo and pulling him up. As Aragorn tried to follow, the stairs continued to fall making him end up holding on by his arms. But he quickly got back onto his feet. The problem they were facing was much more obvious. The gap between the two staircases had been widened even more, making jumping downright suicidal. Both Aragorn and Frodo were leaning back to avoid falling and once he had run out of knives to throw, Sasuke had also taken their stance. Steady, Aragorn told the two of them. Hold on. That's what we're doing, Aragorn. Sasuke told him with the smallest amount of sarcasm the situation would allow. Another loud growl was heard and more rocks fell from the ceiling. One large rock struck the flat portion of the staircase the three were balancing on, smashing through and making the declining portion an island. What was worse was the pillar holding that particular portion of the staircase began to weaken and crumble. It began to move in accordance to how the three of them shifted their balance. Hang on! Aragorn said to Frodo and Sasuke as they tried to keep the stairs from falling the wrong way. The pillar continued to crack and break, creating a groaning sound and making more dangerous for them. Lean forward, the ranger told them, shifting his weight forward. The other two did as he did and with a groan, the pillar fell forward. It fell closer and closer to the rest of the fellowship, and just as it smashed into the lower staircase, they jumped into friendly arms. As the pillar fell into the abyss, Breaking into pieces as it fell, the fellowship raced down the rest of the staircase, hurrying along so that they would not have the same problem twice. 
As they reached the bridge, Sasuke got a closer look at it. It was a single, narrow stone bridge with nothing to protect anyone from falling off. He had no doubt in his mind that if a certain bridge builder he had known once had seen this bridge, he would have started ranting about the idiocy of those who built it. Over the bridge. Fly. Gandalf commanded the fellowship, urging them on with his staff and sword. Sasuke was the last one in the group, allowing the others to go first. But a loud growl at their backs made them stop in their tracks and turn to see a great fire blazing before them. Out of that fire came something covered in smoke and fire. Sasuke had thought the orcs he had hunted through the years had been oni, but what towered over him put that frame of mind away for good. This was an oni. It had dark wings made of bones and black skin that showed flecks of fire beneath it. Shadows and smoke covered it like a cloak. Two horns curled downward on its head and when it roared at them, the back of its mouth was an inferno. It took a step towards them and they remembered that they still had feet. They ran for the bridge and the Balrog followed them. But it was only when they started crossing the bridge that Gandalf had noticed that one of them had barely moved. What are you doing, Sasuke? He demanded. Get across that bridge, Gandalf, the shinobi told him, facing the Balrog. I'm expendable, you're not. I can buy you some time to get out. He morphed his Sharingan into something he hadn't used in ten years, the Mangekyo Sharingan. He stepped forward, drew his Chikudo, and activated his Susanoo. The fellowship watched he became engulfed in purple flames that rapidly took the shape of a heavily armored person, wielding a sword of black fire in its left hand. Sasuke was annoyed by the fact that, due to the height of the floor to the ceiling, there wasn't enough room for him to create a perfect form. But he could make do with what he had. He moved his jutsu forward to fight the Balrog, rising the sword up and swinging it down. But when the Balrog met him, he realized that he had forgotten two important things. The first was that he hadn't used this jutsu in over ten years and had some rust with it. The second was that fire could match fire. The Balrog caught the sword with its bare hands and tore it apart like it was nothing. Since he had connected that sword with his Chikudo, the Chikudo shattered, making him drop the hilt with a hiss. The sheath, which had been in his other hand, began to grow hot, making him drop it as well. The Balrog didn't stop there. It grabbed the left shoulder of the Susanoo and held it tightly. Orange fire began to mix with purple, overwhelming it, and Sasuke began to feel the fire on his coat burning through it. It burned enough of the coat that the sleeve fell off and he gave a brief noise of pain. But the Balrog didn't concern itself with that. It just raised its free fist and punched the Susanoo, shattering it with just that one punch. Sasuke flew back when the Jutsu shattered, landing hard and rolling limply a few times, tearing the coat even more so. He had rolled far enough that his arm and head dangled over the edge. As he tried to get his wits back and figure out what the hell had just happened, he felt a hand grab him by the coat and pulled back onto his feet. Get across that bridge, Sasuke. You are outmatched. Now go. He could only do as he was ordered. He ran across the bridge, all but tearing off the coat as he ran, for it was still burning, and letting fall into the abyss. When he reached the end, he turned to see that Gandalf had stopped on the bridge and was facing the Balrog. You cannot pass, the wizard told it. Gandalf, shouted Frodo in horror from the stairs on the other side of the bridge. The Balrog responded to his challenge by drawing itself up and revealing itself fully, using its own fire to illuminate what it was. But the Grey Wizard was not impressed. I am a servant of the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Aener, he told the Balrog, raising his staff to create a shield of white light. In response, the Balrog drew a sword of flame from out of nowhere. The dark fire will not avail you, flame of Yudin. The Balrog slammed its sword down against the shield. Sparks flew as the two battled for victory, but neither won. Both the shield and the sword faded away into nothing. The Balrog stepped back after losing the sword, but then stepped forward again and roared at Gandalf. Go back to the shadow, the wizard commanded. The Balrog took another step forward, stepping onto the bridge. In its hand, it formed a whip of flame, swinging it around and snapping it in the air. In response, Gandalf lifted his arms and brought his staff and sword together. You shall not pass, he cried. 
He slammed the tip of his staff into the bridge and their brief flash of white light. For a second, Balrog and Wizard looked at one another. Then the Balrog charged forward and it became obvious of what Gandalf did. The part of the bridge the Balrog was on broke apart, falling into the abyss below. The Balrog, completely surprised by this, could only fall with it. The rest of the fellowship breathed a sigh of relief. Gandalf had beaten the Balrog. The wizard himself released a tired breath and turned away from the ruined bridge. And that was when the tide turned. In a last-ditch effort, the Balrog swung its whip upward and caught the wizard by the leg and pulled him down. Caught off guard by this, Gandalf fell down over the edge. He held on by his hands, for his sword and staff fell into the abyss, but the whip was still trying to pull him down. Frodo tried to rush down to help, but Boromir caught him and held him back. No, the man from Gundor told him. No. Gandalf, screamed the hobbit. Sasuke was still at the end of the bridge, and so he acted. He all but ran down the length of the ruined bridge, and fell to his stomach when he was in reach of the end. Gandalf, take my hand, he told the wizard, extending his right arm out. Gandalf reached up and out to the hand. Their fingers almost touched when an arrow sailed down from above and pinned Sasuke's hand to the bridge. Shocked at the sudden feeling of pain, the shinobi looked at where they had come and saw goblins with bows standing there. Legolas. Aragorn. He shouted back at the elf and man as he pulled the arrow from the stone of the bridge and seeing the point was protruding from the palm. But whatever he was going to say next died in his mouth when he saw the look on the wizard's face. He had seen that look before. Don't do it, he silently began to beg. Don't do it. Don't you dare it, old man. But Gandalf did. Fly, you fools. He told them all before disappearing over the edge. When Sasuke looked over it, he saw the wizard falling into the abyss. Nuh! Screamed Frodo as he watched the wizard fall. He tried to break free of Boromir's grip, but the man refused to let go. Instead, he picked up the hobbit and carried him as he ran up the stairs, following the rest of the fellowship. Aragorn! Sasuke! He called out to the remaining people there, stopping for a moment before continuing upwards. They heard his call and fell back up the stairs, avoiding the arrows the goblins shot at them. They quickly caught up to the rest of the fellowship and together, they ran out the east gate of Moria. As they felt the light of the sun on them and the feel of fresh air, their quick pace came to a stop as they realized what had just happened. They had lost Gandalf, a member of the fellowship. Sam sat down on a rock and started crying, for he could not help but remember all the good memories he had of the wizard. Mary sat on a nearby rock, holding Pippin in his lap. The two hobbits were crying as well, but the took more so. It's my fault, he kept thinking to himself. All of this, it's my fault. It's all my fault. Let go of me. Let me go. Gimli shouted as he tried to get out of Boromir's grip. He wanted to go straight back into those mines and attacked every single one of those goblins. I'll kill them. I'll send them down into that abyss after them. Let me go. Gimli, it's too late. Boromir told the dwarf as he held him back. It's too late. He's gone. There's nothing we can do. He's gone. The dwarf only slightly stopped struggling. But now, he had tears in his eyes and started cursing in dwarfish. Legolas could only stand there amidst the rocks. He had never thought he would see the day when a wizard would fall. Legolas, he heard Aragorn call out to him and turned to look at the ranger, who was cleaning his sword. Get them up. He did nothing for a second before going over to Merry and Pippin. Give them a moment, for pity's sake. Boromir told Aragorn from where he stood over Gimli who had fallen to the earth and started banging the rocks with the hilt of his axe. By nightfall, these hills will be swarming with orcs, he told the man from Gundor in return. We must reach the woods of Lothlorien. He sheathed his sword. Come, Boromir, Legolas. Gimli, get them up. He reached Sam and helped him stand. On your feet, Sam, he told the hobbit, who nodded shakily in response. Frodo had wandered away somewhat from the rest of the fellowship along with Sasuke. Frodo? Frodo. Sasuke. Aragorn called out after them. They turned to look back at him. We have some place to be, right? 
Sasuke asked the ranger in a controlled voice. Aragorn only nodded once in agreement, and went back to the rest of the fellowship. Sasuke, Frodo said, realizing something about the raven-haired man. You still have the arrow in your hand. The shinobi looked at the arrow. The area around the pierced part of his hand still dripped blood, but slowly. Without saying anything else, he snapped the back part of the arrow off and pulled out the rest of it. The scream that followed echoed throughout the area and even into the mines. The fellowship was never sure if it was a scream of anger, rage, pain, or sorrow. Chapter 7 Under the Trees Location The Fellowship They made good time in getting down from the east gate of Moria and into the fields that stood outside the woods. They did not stop there. They could not stop. They had to keep moving so they could find safety. But as soon as they walked into the woods of Lothlorien, they did not feel safe. In fact, all they felt was silence. They could hear the woods all around them and they could see it, hearing the sounds of the animals that lived go about their lives and seeing the leaves fall off of the trees. But that was it. Anything just did not seem to be there. Aragorn and Legolas led the way while Sasuke and Boromir took to the back. The blood from Sasuke's wound had turned dry and crusty, but the pain was still there. Even when he looked at the wound, he could tell that it would scar. He did not earn that scar, but he did deserve it. Gandalf had been right there, and he couldn't save him. Now is not the time for that, he silently berated himself. You must help the others find safety. Stay close, young hobbits, Gimli told the hobbits, as the five of them were the middle of the traveling group. The dwarf had his axe out and ready to use, but for what they didn't know. They say that a great sorceress lives in these words. An elf witch of terrible power, he said to them, walking forward carefully. All who look upon her fall under her spell and are never seen again. Sasuke, who had heard those words, couldn't help but roll his eyes. You'd best hope Legolas didn't hear that, Gimli, he thought to himself. It didn't look like the elf had heard the dwarf. He was still up at the front, following Aragorn in the path the ranger made. Unbeknownst to the shinobi and the dwarf, Frodo heard a voice in his head. Frodo, it whispered his name. He looked around, trying to see where the voice was coming from but could see nothing. It was like a ghost or spirit in the wind. Then the voice spoke again and when it did, he saw a brief vision of blue eyes looking directly at him. Your coming to us is as the footsteps of doom. You bring great evil here. Ring bearer. Mr. Frodo? Sam said to him, bringing him back to where he was. He didn't say anything to his gardener. He couldn't find any words to say. All he could do was keep walking forward. Well, here's one dwarf she won't ensnare so easily, Gimli declared. I have the eyes of a hawk and the ears of a fox. It was at that moment, two drawn arrows were pointed at his face, making him stop in his tracks. Oh, he wasn't the only one. Elves with bows drawn and arrows knocked appeared out of nowhere. Everyone, even Sasuke, was surprised by their appearance. Legolas had his own bow drawn and knocked. If he had been alone, the shinobi would have tried to have gotten away, either by smoke bombs or grabbing one of the elves as a shield. But he didn't have any smoke bombs anymore, and he couldn't leave the fellowship alone with them. The dwarf breathed so loud, we could have shot him in the dark one of the elves boasted as he walked forward towards Aragorn. It was obvious that he was the captain of the group. The dwarf in question growled at those words, but that earned him the arrows getting closer to his face. Aragorn, these woods are perilous, he told the ranger. We should go back. You have entered the realm of the Lady of the Wood, the elf captain said to Gimli. You cannot go back. He looked at the rest of the elves with him. Keep them under close guard, he ordered them. They lowered their bows, but they still had arrows knocked. The fellowship was forced to follow the captain as he led them deeper into the woods. They did where they were going and for the hobbits, that was a familiar but still uneasy feeling. They walked all through the rest of the day and well into the night. When it came time to rest, they were led up onto a series of platforms in the trees, which they would learn were called flets. By that time, the attitude to them seemed to have changed somewhat. Aragorn, Legolas, Boromir, and Gimli stood before the elf captain, who spoke to Aragorn and Legolas in Elvish, which they would later translate for the rest of the fellowship. May Govanon, Legolas Thranduilian, 
Welcome Legolas, son of Thranduil, he said to Legolas, briefly placing a hand on his heart. Govanas vin Gwenin Lu, Halder O'Lorian, our fellowship stands in your debt, Halder of Lorian, Legolas said in reply. He looked past Boromir and at the other man there. A. Aragorn and Dundain Estan and Le Ammon. Oh, Aragorn of the Dundain, you are known to us, he said in greeting. Halder, Aragorn returned the greeting. So much for the legendary courtesy of the elves, Gimli grumbled. Once he had stepped onto the flet, he had taken his helmet off. Speak words we can all understand. He practically ordered Halder. The elf captain merely turned his gaze onto him. We have not had dealings with the dwarves since the dark days. And do you know what this dwarf says to that? He spat something in dwarfish that nobody wanted to or would translate. But before any of the elves could do anything in response, a hand flew out and struck the dwarf hard on the head. Baka Sasuke said as he pulled his hand away. Courtesy must been given as well as received. He wasn't even looking at the rest of the people there. He was looking out at the woods. Lad, you don't even know what I said. I didn't need to. I could hear enough in your tone of voice, he said, turning around. Halder's eyes widened slightly when he saw the raven-haired man. Hello again, Crabender, he said in greeting. Sasuke narrowed his eyes at the elf captain. I know you, don't I? From seven years ago. He fell silent as he tried to remember. Were you the one I had to literally pull out of an ambush? No, that was my brother. You saved him and yet you did not stay to fight off the orcs. I was tracking a different orc band that had taken children with them and had a three-day lead on me. It was a good enough of an answer for the elves, for it said nothing else about it. In fact, the subject was completely changed. You are wounded, Halda noted, looking at his right hand. An arrow pierced it, he answered. And you have not tended to it. We didn't have the time. We were running for our lives and to safety. He looked to one of the elves under his command. Tend to his wound, he ordered. If the elf had a problem with the order, he did not say. Instead, he went straight over to Sasuke and began to do as he was ordered. Halder's gaze went past the hobbits as this happened and he stopped when his eyes met Frodo's. You bring great evil with you, he told the hobbit with a coldness in his voice. He turned back to look at Aragorn. You can go no further. He walked away and Aragorn went after him silently telling the fellowship to wait before walking away. The two of them started to speak rapidly, but quietly and elvish while the others waited. Frodo sat on the platform in silence, looking around at the rest of the fellowship. To his sadness, none of them held his gaze long. Gandalf's death was not in vain, Boromir told the hobbit from where he sat across from him, thinking that his silence was in sorrow, and perhaps it was. Nor would he have you give up hope, you carry a heavy burden, Frodo. Don't carry the weight of the dead. Sasuke was nearby with a freshly bandaged hand. When he heard those words, he had to restrain himself from snorting in derision. For some of us, Boromir, we have no choice in carrying the dead, he thought to himself, thinking of his clan and his brother. The hushed voices stopped and Halder came back to them. You will follow me, he told all of them. They stood up and followed him through the trees always walking on the flats. They did not ask where they were going or how long they would be walking in fear that he would just leave them there, alone in a strange place to most of them. After what seemed like an hour or three to them, they finally stopped on a flat that almost looked the same as all the others, with the only difference being an actual roof over their hands. You will rest here for the night, Halder told them. He left them alone with a few guards to keep watch, and they began to settle in. No one said anything as they made themselves comfortable. The silence was broken when Gimli saw a harp nearby, went over to it, picked it up, and began tuning it. What are you doing, Gimli? Legolas asked him. The elves who kept watch paid closer attention to him. Playing a dwarf song of lamentation, he answered, still tuning the harp. Gandalf deserves that much. Once he was done tuning, he began to play it and sing. Start I see fire. O oh, misty eye of the mountain below, keep careful watch of my brother's souls. And should the sky be filled with fire and smoke, keep watching over Durant's sons. If this is to end in fire, then we should all burn together. 
watch the flames climb high into the night. Calling out, Father, O stand by, and we will. Watch the flames burn Auburn on. The mountain side high. And if we should die tonight, we should all die together. Raise a glass of wine for the last time. Calling out, Father, O. Prepare as we will. Watch the flames burn Auburn on. The mountain side. Desolation comes upon the sky. Now I see fire. Inside the mountain. I see fire. Burning the trees. And I see fire. Hollowing souls. I see fire. Blood in the breeze. And I hope that you'll remember me. Oh, should my people fall then. Surely I'll do the same. Confined in mountain halls. We got too close to the flame. Calling out Father O. Hold fast and we will. Watch the flames burn Auburn on. The mountain side. Desolation comes upon the sky. Now I see fire. Inside the mountains. I see fire. Burning the trees. And I see fire. Hollowing souls. I see fire. Blood in the breeze. And I hope that you'll remember me. And if the night is burning, I will cover my eyes. For if the dark returns then, my brothers will die. And as the sky is falling down, it crashed into this lonely town. And with that shadow upon the ground, I hear my people screaming out. And I see fire. Inside the mountains, I see fire. Burning the trees, I see fire. Hollowing souls, I see fire. Blood in the breeze. I see fire, fire. Oh, you know I saw a city burning out. And I see fire, fire. Feel the heat upon my skin. And I see fire, fire. Ah. Uh, and I see fire. Burn Auburn on the mountain side. And I see fire. Everyone who had heard him sing was stunned to hear it. They did not think that he would have such a clear voice. But it was more than that. It was the song he sung. That was beautiful, Gimli, Mary told him. Whoever wrote that should be praised for creating such a song. When I return, I'll be sure to pass on your words to Bomber, he replied as he set the harp down. He wrote it in honor to Thor and Oakenshield after the Battle of the Five Armies. Bomber? repeated Legolas with a small look of concentration, remembering the dwarf in question. You mean the fattest dwarf of Thorin's company? Say what you will about his weight and eating habits, but that dwarf has the skill and soul of a musician. It's only a pity he did not use it more. His face fell a little. And I know it isn't exactly right for Gandalf, but I could think of no other way to sing for him. No one said anything against him, no one could. The grief of losing Gandalf was still there. Not even the elves that lived in the woods said anything against him and the song he had played and sang. The rest of the night was spent in silence, for the fellowship fell asleep and dreamed. But they all dreamed the same dream, Gandalf falling again and again. The next morning, after a quick breakfast, Halder came for them again. They descended from the flat and walked along the forest floor. It was a walk in silence with elves to their front and their back and took the better part of the day. Had sorrow not plagued them, they might have seen the beauty of the woods around them much more than they did now. They finally stopped when they crested a hill and saw the land beneath them. Before, just beyond the valley created by the hill it was on and the hill they stood on, were great trees placed so close together, it was almost hard to see where one ended and another began. Karas Galadhan, the heart of Elvendom on earth, realm of the Lord Celeborn and of Galadriel, Lady of Light, Halder said as he looked upon it, a breath of wonder in his voice. When they went down the hill, went across the valley, and entered the place, Sasuke could only look around and admit to one thing. This is what a true village in the leaves should look like. For this place was built into the trees, not just surrounding them. If the Shodain Hokage could see this place, would he be inspired or jealous? They were led to a staircase that spiraled upwards into one of the largest trees there. So long was their climb that even as they climbed, the light of the sun outside the woods set and the day turned into night. And they still climbed. After a climb that lasted a long time for the fellowship, 
They came out of the staircase to see a hall nestled in thick tree branches. Halder led them into the hall, to a platform that was before a staircase. As they waited, a glowing light at the top of the stairs began to brighten, getting their attention. Two elves, clothed in silver and white, slowly and gracefully descended down the stairs, holding each other's hands. They were Celeborn and Galadriel, who ruled Lothlorien. The enemy knows you have entered here. Celeborn told them as he and Galadriel stood before them. What hope you had in secrecy is now gone. He looked at each one of them more closely. Eight that are here, yet ten set out from Rivendell. Tell me, where is Gandalf? For I much desire to speak with him. I can no longer see him from afar. Gandalf the Grey did not pass the borders of this land. Galadriel spoke softly, yet the fellowship could hear her easily enough. He has fallen into shadow. No one said a word, at first. It was all they could do to keep eye contact with her. Some of them could not do it. It was Legolas who broke the silence and confessed. He was taken by both shadow and flame. A Balrog of Morgoth, for we went needlessly into the net of Moria, he told the two of them, surprising them. Gimli's face fell when he listened to those words. It had been his suggestion that they go through Moria. He had thought it would be safe. How wrong he was. Needless were none of the deeds of Gandalf in life, Galadriel told Legolas. We do not yet know his full purpose. Her eyes went over to the dwarf and the fellowship. Do not let the great emptiness of Khazad-dum fill your heart, Gimli, son of Gloin, she said to him. For the world has grown full of peril. And in all lands love is now mingled with grief. Her eyes turned to look at Boromir. The man from Gundor and the elf of Lothlorien stared into each other's eyes. But he could not hold her gaze and he looked away with a gasp of breath. What now becomes of this fellowship? Celeborn asked. Without Gandalf, all hope is lost. The quest stands on the edge of a knife, his wife said to the fellowship. Stray but a little and it will fail to the ruin of all. She looked at them all, seeing the troubles in their eyes. Yet, hope remains while the company is true. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Go now and rest, for you are weary with sorrow and much toil. While she spoke, her eyes went over to Frodo and he heard her voice in his head. Welcome, Frodo of the Shire, one who has seen the eye. To his credit, he did nothing to show he had heard it. That may be, Celeborn said. But as I said, eight that are here, yet ten set out from Rivendell. You are missing one more. Where is the stranger to Middle-earth? Where is Crabender? Surprised by this question, the fellowship looked around and did not see Sasuke standing with them. But he was standing right here, Sam protested, pointing at a spot next to him. He was here beside me. If they had looked over the edge of the platform, they would have found him. He was the other side, plastered against it, looking straight down to the ground. Do not be troubled, my love, he heard Galadriel say. Crabender is with the fellowship and will not abandon them so easily. That was what she said aloud. What she said in his head was different. You do not need to fear me, Sasuke, son of Figaku, heir to the Uchiha clan. I know you from before. Get out of my mind, he practically ordered her. The faint presence that he felt inside his mind when she spoke disappeared. While he felt some relief, it was not complete. It wasn't her ability to speak inside his mind that made him plaster his back against the other side of the platform to hide from her. It was her eyes. He had seen those kinds of eyes before. Once they had met their host, they were escorted back down to the ground and to an area large enough for them to camp comfortably and sleep under a large pavilion next to a water fountain. All around them, as they finished preparing the camp, the woods echoed with the sound of sorrowful voices. A lament for Gandalf. Legolas declared as he listened to the voices. Those who were still awake looked up at the trees, as if the voices were there. Why do they say about him? Mary asked the elf. I have not the heart to tell you, he said in reply. For me, the grief is still too near. You're not the only one, Sasuke said shortly from he sat on the ground against a tree branch. He could still the old man hanging off the ruined bridge, trying to reach out and take his hand. I bet they don't mention his fireworks, Sam commented to Mary from where he knelt on the ground, trying to lay his bedding. There should be a verse about them. He stood up and began to sing. The finest rockets ever seen. 
They burst in stars of blue and green. Or after thunder silver showers. Came falling like a rain of flowers. Oh, that doesn't do them justice by a long shot, he admitted after that one verse, sitting back down. No one really said a word after that. Some of them had noticed that Aragorn and Boromir were off to the side and talking with one another, but what they spoke of was none of their concern, especially Sasuke. Not wanting to see Gandalf's face before he fell again, the shinobi tried to get comfortable and fell asleep. He found himself laying on the riverbank of that oh-so-familiar valley. His entire world was nothing but pain and yet, it seemed like a faraway thing. He knew that there was a rock digging into his back, but it did not bother him. He was exhausted, and yet not tired at all. All these things and more were what told him that he was dreaming of an old memory. The sound of someone wading through water filled his ears and he looked to the river to see the closet thing he had to a best friend and rival stand beside him. Well, Naruto, congratulations. You've finally beaten me, he said. The blonde said nothing, so he did. So what will you do now? Will you kill me? Will you take me back to the village so I can stand trial for what I've done? Or will you bring me back and hope that the Hokage will forgive me and allow me to join the village again? You know that probably won't happen, Sasuke, his friend said back, still standing. I know. You will kill me. It wasn't a question as it was a simple stating of the fact. I doubt that many in the village will mourn my passing, probably just Sakura and a few die-hard fangirls. There was a small scowl on the blonde's face. Did you just call Sakura a fangirl? He couldn't help but roll his eyes at that. I said Sakura and a few die-hard fangirls, he repeated himself. Sakura is a kunoichi, now more than ever. There is a bit of difference, like the fact that she could and would punch those fangirls into next year. Yeah, she can do that. I would know well enough. They shared a small chuckle at that, remembering better days. But it wouldn't last. It's past time this ended, Naruto. Just kill me. He took a breath and closed his eyes. I am ready. He waited in his personal darkness for the killing strike, for it to finally end. But instead, all he heard from Naruto was one word. No. He opened his eyes again. What? I said no. He reached down and pulled Sasuke up onto his feet. I'm not going to kill you, Sasuke. You have to. No, I don't. You're my friend, Sasuke, he declared, clasping his other hand on his friend's shoulder. Why would I want to kill my best friend? It's not a matter of want to, but have to. I am a criminal, Naruto. You can't just sweep that under the rug and pretend that it never existed. I'm not going to do that either. Then what are you going to do to me? He couldn't help but ask the question with curiosity in his voice as well as a small amount of fire. I won't do anything to you, Sasuke. He removed his hands. But you will leave. It was almost like he had spoken in a different language. Leave? The blonde nodded. I'm giving you this one chance to leave the elemental nations, for your own safety. Leave now so you can live. You know that the others won't be so merciful. He turned around and walked back across the river. Goodbye, Sasuke. He said nothing. He just followed the course of the river. He came awake with no failing out of his sleep or shouting in panic, surprise, or fear. In fact, he opened his eyes silently and stood up from where he laid in silence. This wouldn't be the first time he had this dream since coming to Middle-earth, and he knew what followed afterwards. He would follow the river until it emptied out into the sea. He did not know what country that had been in, and he did not care. All he had cared about was that no one knew who he was there and that there was an Akatsuki hideout in there. He patched his wounds there and rested for a day. As he rested, he was tempted to ignore what Naruto had all but ordered him to do and stay in the elemental nations. But he also knew that what the blonde had said was true, the other villages, and even Konoha probably, wouldn't hesitate to hunt him down. So the next day... After grabbing enough supplies to last him for a while and grabbing a cloak of the Akatsuki and a straw hat, he went down to the docks. He was lucky in the fact that the first ship that he went to was in fact sailing out that day. He got himself passage and was in a comfortable bunk when the ship left the harbor and headed for Middle-earth, though he didn't know that yet. 
It was on that ship that Sasuke figured out that when Naruto had grabbed his hand and clasped his shoulder, he sealed the power given to him by the Rikudo Sinin. The ship made port in what he later knew as the Grey Havens, but he didn't stay there long enough for people to see him, which was why he only found out about elves later. Once he was out and in the wilds, he decided to wander. And even though he wandered, that dream still came to him. Sometimes, he briefly wondered why that was. But those moments were fleeting and he didn't pay them much heed. He was gone from the elemental nations, and it wasn't likely he would return. He looked around and saw that the rest of the fellowship was still sleeping. The only exception was Frodo, for he wasn't there. Where did that hobbit get off to? He asked himself before leaving to find out. He was able to go look mostly due to the fact that he could never go back to sleep after having that dream. He wandered away from the area where the fellowship slept and into Lothlorien itself. The voices were still singing and because there was no one else around, it made them feel even more haunting. At night, the woods could not have been more different from Kanoha. The nightlife in Kanoha was loud, boisterous, and full of good things for friends who want to hang out. Here, there was no nightlife and it gave the place an ethereal quality that was also somewhat chilling. As he wandered, he couldn't help but think of that dream. What unnerved him about it every time he had it was not how he was so close to death and yet was given life or the choice Naruto made. No, what unnerved him the most was the look he had seen in the blonde's eyes as he had spoken. No matter how many times he had tried to mentally erase it, that damn look still kept appearing in his mind. It was the look that said, no matter what you do or what people will say of you, you're still my best friend and I believe in you. How many times had he let that idiot blonde down with his belief? And yet, he stills believes in him? It was like Cammy was playing a bad joke with him, and he didn't it funny. But still, he could always see those eyes and when he did, he felt afraid. The sound of footsteps that weren't his own walking on the grass snapped him out of his thoughts and back into the woods where he was. Frodo was walking his way with a slightly scared look on his face. For some reason he couldn't figure out, he hid himself and let the hobbit pass by. Why did I just do that? He asked himself as he pulled himself out of the hiding spot. He didn't know and it irked him. Another set of footsteps, sounding incredibly light, echoed through the silence of Lothlorien. He turned to see Galadriel walking away from him, casting a look back at him. Not fully knowing why, he followed her. He didn't run to catch up with her. He instead kept his distance and always made sure that she was within eyesight. His following her led him to a wall of rocks that, at first appearance, had no entrance. But as he followed and saw how she entered, he realized that it was only a matter of perception. Once he changed that perception, by stepping to the left, he could see the entrance and entered it. The passage beyond led to something that surprised him a lot a rock garden. He hadn't seen one in ten years. What's more, this garden was beautifully done. No amateur had made it. The flow in the rocks was subtle and changed course before you even recognized that it had. The plants in and around the garden were the perfect choice for it. Whoever had done this was very talented and had good taste. She was standing at the edge of the garden, looking at it all. When he stepped forward, she turned to him and smiled gently. Welcome, Uchiha Sasuke, she greeted him in perfect elemental. He was a little surprised by hearing that speech. How do you know the language of the elemental nations? He demanded, replying in the same tongue. You taught it to me, a long time ago. I've never met you until tonight. But you have. As I said, I know you from before. What does that even mean? I don't know you. He looked away from and stared intently at the garden and stop looking at me with those eyes. You have no right to do so. What right would that be? There was no hostility in her voice from being told what to do. She sounded just as serene and calm as before. In fact, there was a small note of curiosity in her voice. But he didn't answer her. Instead, he turned his gaze upward to the tree. What exactly is the point you're trying to make here, Cammy? He asked aloud, not caring that there was another person with him. You send me Naruto when he was a kid in the form of Pippin, then you send me my friendship in the form of Gimli and Legolas, and now you send me his trust in me in the form of her? When is this sick joke of yours going to end? He demanded, the clasp he had over his emotions breaking ever so slightly. 
He got no answer from above. But he did get one from Galadriel. Whatever the one has decided to grant you, it is never a joke. He turned to look at her. It certainly feels like that to me. He looked away again. She still had that look in her eyes. Why do you keep looking at me like that? I cannot enjoy the company of an old friend? She asked him, that note of curiosity still there. I already told you, I've never met you. And I have told you twice before, I know you from before. Out of the corner of his eye he saw her smile. It is good to see you again, Indra. He went still at those words. Truth be told, he shouldn't have been surprised by her words. If the Lord of Rivendell had known his ancestor, why wouldn't she? But there was still one thing to question. How do you know I am him? He asked, finally looking at her, but still avoiding the eyes. You carry yourself in the same manner he did, quiet yet proud. And there is also the obvious. She gestured to his left arm. You carry the same mark. A slight frown appeared on her face. But I have never seen it covered so. He shifted slightly. He wasn't sure why. It was sealed, he said shortly. How well did you know him? The frown disappeared and a slightly sad smile formed on her lips. If I had been a younger elf and not married when I met him, I would have gladly become mortal for him. So, that well, he thought to himself. It also explained why she had that look in her eyes. In a sense, she did have the right, but that didn't mean he liked it. Is there a particular reason why we are talking here, in a rock garden? He gestured to the garden to emphasize his point. He taught me how to make one and this was the result. Do you like it? It's well done, from what I can tell. He wasn't a gardener. That had been Naruto, which came as a surprise to him and Sakura found out about that fact and the little greenhouse he had. But that's not why you led me here. No, it is not. She looked him in the eyes and he found that he could not look away. Do you know why you carry that mark and why you have followed the footsteps of your ancestors to this land? Of course he knew why he carried the mark of a dark moon on his hand. It was given to me by the Rikudo Sinin, Indra's father. As for following my ancestors, I just took the ship that was sailing away from the elemental nations. There was no following. So you would believe, but you are here. As for your being given it, that is not so. Atsutsuki Hagoromo merely activated it inside of you. That's impossible. He carried both and gave them both away. He remembered what happened in that meeting quite clearly. Perhaps, the beginning of the tale would be a better place to explain. He couldn't help but snort at that. I know what happened at the beginning. The question is, do you? She only smiled and shook her head slightly. No, the question is, what do you think is the beginning? The Rikudo Sinin and his brother defeated their mother and sealed her chakra and her body away in different forms. The chakra into him and the body was made into the moon. That is where you are wrong. The moon had existed long before the battle. To Lion, the Maya who was given charge of the moon, knew them well and had agreed to place the body inside the moon. But this is not the beginning I speak of. I speak of the beginning of their mother, the one you know as Atsutsuki Kagaya. She looked like she was trying to find something in his eyes. Did you ever wonder where she had come from? No. All I ever needed to know was how mad and dangerous she was, he answered. Then let me tell you of her so that you may understand what happened. He was silent for a moment. Fine, he finally answered. It began in the end days of the First Age, where the First Dark Lord was all but victorious in his conquest of Middle-earth. One day, a woman was found at the steps leading to his fortress of Onband. Thinking of Luthien and Baron and believing that another had come to take the remaining Silmarils from, he went to the steps to attack. But he discovered that the woman there was not of the elves but rather men. And she had not come to steal the Silmarils, for she was heavy with child and had been trying to seek safety but knew she would not find it. The Dark Lord found her on the steps, crying as she looked up at the stars. He demanded to know why she was crying. I am sad and scared, she answered. I will not see the next sunrise and my child will not see its first. If that is your sadness, what is your fear, he demanded. I am dying, but I do not know what is beyond death. I have no wish to take my child with me into that unknown abyss. The Dark Lord was unconcerned by these words. 
such is the gift of men. But such a gift should not be given to a babe just born. She gasped in pain as she began to give birth. Her labor was long and hard, for she had no one to help her and the Dark Lord did not know what to do. But when she was done, she held a child in her arms, a daughter. Please, if you can, save her, she begged. Do you know who I am? He asked with poisonous amusement in his voice. She nodded. Yes, you are Morgoth, the Dark Lord who threatens all. Then why ask me to save your child when I could easily kill both of you right now? Who else can I ask at this moment? If it means that my child will live a long life instead of dying soon after being born, I will gladly ask for your help. With those last words, the woman died. The Dark Lord looked down at the dead woman and the child she held in her grasp. He took the child from her and held it in his great hand. It was a weakly child who did not have the strength to cry out anymore. But in its eyes, there was nothing but curiosity and trust for him, even though the rest of the world shunned and hated him. In a moment of compassion he hadn't had since he turned from Eru, he imparted some of his essence onto her. She survived it, her black hair turning red, and became much more healthier. He named her Burial, for the color of her hair, and took her back into Anban to rise as his daughter. For forty years he raised her, teaching her about life and its choices. She proved to be an apt student and learned well. But when the tides turned against him in the War of Wrath, he sent her away. She went silent, which prompted him to speak. And then what happened? Before she answered, a scream pierced the night. They both turned to the entrance of the garden where the scream had come from. Galadriel left first, and he followed after her. Their quick pace led to them a group of elves encircling something. My lady, I'm sorry one of the elves said when he saw the Lady of Light approach. He broke himself free again. It is all right, I will speak to him, she said, walking forward into the circle. Sasuke followed so he could a good look at what was going on. What he saw was a youngish-looking elf, it was a little hard to tell sometimes, on the ground rocking back and forth with his hands covering his head. Hineron, it is all right. The tainted is not here. He was calling me, The elf on the ground muttered as he rocked. He was calling me. I could hear him. I could hear him calling out for me to come. Did you break free so you could to him? Her tone was gentle, but there was an audible knot of disappointment in it as well. No, he shouted, rocking faster than before. No, I broke free so I could run away from him. I promise. If I stayed, he would have come. I had to run away. I'm sorry. She smiled and stopped his rocking with her hands. I'm glad to hear that from you. You are amongst friends, Hineron. Stand on your own two feet. She removed her hands and stepped. After a moment, the elf on the ground stood up and looked at the crowd surrounding him. When Sasuke saw the elf standing before him, his eyes widened in shock and surprise. With no warning to anyone else, he walked out of the crowd, towards the elf, and grabbed him by the chin to look more closely at him. What he saw was still there even when he looked more closely. That shouldn't be possible, he declared, but it was still there. The fellowship came awake in the morning, finding that food had been set out for them. No one said a word as they ate, but they had all noticed the same thing. Where was Sasuke? The person in question soon appeared in the camp. Where have you been, lad? Gimli asked him. Around, he said shortly before looking at the ranger amongst them. Aragorn? We're going to stay here a while. Two weeks, a month at the most. That got a surprise out of everyone there. Why are we doing that? Pippin asked. So I can give him a quick study on how to be a shinobi. He pointed his thumb at the elf who stood behind and to the side of him. So focused had the fellowship been on him that they didn't realize the elf was there until he was pointed out. The elf looked young, not quite a child but not quite an adult. His hair was shorter than other elves and its ends were black as a raven. Who is he? Legolas asked, looking at the other elf. Even though he had never seen him before, there was something familiar about him. The elf prince just couldn't place it. The elves here call him Hineron and he is the son of Madara. As of now, he is my student. The entire fellowship was stunned into silence at those words, for they could not believe it. Durant's beard. Swore Gimli, still stunned. 